Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, October 5th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Aaron Kleinman, Director of Research for the States Project at Future Now. On the Virginia election and what it means for the midterms and the country. Also on the program today, Facebook on the hot seat. As a whistleblower testifies on the Hill. And Chuck Schumer to bring up another sure to fail debt ceiling vote tomorrow and the Democrats never ending quest to get people to blame Mitch McConnell for something they don't know about or care about (laughs) Joe Biden to hit the road finally to promote the actual policies in the reconciliation bill that he is now already chopped in half State Department advisor Harold Coe resigns over Title 42. Second person out of the State Department to resign over our treatment of would-be refugees. Biden administration releases another major new rule on surprise billing. And no surprise... Medical providers are upset. Speaking of no, no word on why Facebook and WhatsApp had a six hour outage yesterday. Or why we can't have a six year outage. Six century outage. (laughs) Johnson and Johnson seeks FDA authorization for a booster shot. And lastly, refugee admissions fell to a record low in 2021 under the Biden administration. All this and more on today's program. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is Tuesday. There's no special nickname for that day. So, so there it is. Tubular it's just, twos. Yeah, two for Tuesday today. Yeah, that's right. It's two, two for Tuesday. Tuesday. Exactly. And I was just going uh, to say to to round out the two for Tuesday. Emma Viglin, hello. And I'm the two. Hello. Well, we're we're both. No, you're two. one. We get it. <laughs> really walked into that one. Um, if I feel a little bit out of sorts, uh, folks, it's because um, one of our uh, well-known callers and fans of this program, Ronald Reagan, um, sent me some apples from the Pacific Northwest. It is a um, another one of those cultivars that comes from the, um, the Honeycrisp. There's been a lot of those lately. Why are you out of sorts about this, though? Well, it's pretty rare that I accept the uh, the premise that a an apple from the Pacific Northwest mm. can be competitive with the apples that we have here in New York State. And um, but I have to concede that the Lucy Glow <gasps> is a pretty good apple. Whoa! Yeah. I don't know if it's better than the Snapdragon. Probably isn't. But it's a pretty good apple. Can I have one? No. Yes, of course. There's a whole box there. I, I've encouraged you to have one. Mm. Are you saying that? It says that now. 
Was how about them apples big in Boston? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to say that a lot. It's true. And Massachusetts got a lot of apples, too. We used to do a lot of apple picking in Massachusetts growing up. Hmm. All right, let's get to this uh, today, uh, folks. Um, there is a, uh, a whistleblower, you know, uh, testifying in front of Facebook. In, in, uh, in front of Congress. In front of Congress. Um, and, of course, uh, w- it's unclear why Facebook went down yesterday. W- you know, just one more example of how monopolies create a problem in terms of, like, um, of our supply lines. Um, WhatsApp didn't have to go down. But Facebook bought it because it didn't want competition. Instagram didn't need to go down, but Facebook also bought Instagram. There you go. It's in, it's insane that Facebook owns Instagram as well. I mean, I know WhatsApp. It's just like to think about those two. Like Instagram is a massive, massive influence on so many people's lives. And Facebook, of course, is a massive influence as well for a different demographic. They just have a they have a chokehold on both the younger generation and the older generation on social media. The, it, we need to break up all of these companies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously we've been saying that here for, I don't know, five years. In and, 2013, uh, Facebook was uh, thinking about buying Twitter. Yeah. Just so. Um, we are going to get to uh, Aaron Kleinman, uh, who's going to tell us what's going on in Virginia, and we're going to talk about um, uh, what's happening in terms of the redistricting, because this is going to be um, uh, make a big difference in, for our midterm elections. Uh, in the meantime, um, Joe Biden apparently is expressing frustration with Kristen Cinema and uh, Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin has now moved on to... Taking issue with the ra- raising of the debt ceiling. I mean, it's, it's, it's just sort of fascinating. These people are working in a bubble. And uh, Joe Biden has finally decided that he's going to go on the road to promote aspects of the Build Back Better bill. It seems to me it's a little bit late. Um, I mean, I guess it's better late than never. But Build Back li- Better late than never. Yes. It would have been, been a good idea to maybe go out and try and sell this, I don't know, six weeks ago, six yeah. months ago. Um, nevertheless, he's going out to do this. He's going to Michigan to a swing state uh, district in Michigan. I should say a swing district in Michigan. That's all well and good to provide some protection, I guess, for some of these uh, House Democrats. But I don't know if he has um, been aware who's been coming to his office every couple of days. And they're not from Michigan. In fact, um, one of those people flew back uh, from Arizona to Washington on Monday. Kristen Cinema decided it was time to return to work. She had collected enough corporate donations, and um, that cocktail hour at that Arizona spa it, it, it allowed her to think a little bit more clearly about the uh, proposals that she will not present to the Biden administration on this compromise she's seeking. Now, I want to say, um, I want to say. That if you are watching this with small children or, or animals, you should probably avert their eyes. What you're going to see, from what I understand in terms of the way this is being covered, is one of the most disturbing things you've ever seen regarding a politician. And just so that you're not blown over by this, you're going to see a woman on a plane walk down the aisle and politely ask a question of her senator who won't even bother to take her earplugs out of her head to to talk to her. I'm going to faint. That's, that's... She said it's more of a doctor or something. Senator, hello, how are you? Sorry, I'm just, I'm Katina. I don't know if you remember me. I just want to know if um, you can commit as, as my senator, as, you, if you can commit to passing a reconciliation that could provide a pathway to citizenship for immigrants. We have been waiting for this for too long. I just need to know if you can commit to passing a budget reconciliation that would include immigration and citizenship 
for people to be protected, like me and many others. Can you commit to that, Senator? Oh, she's, she's been all right with that, so. Sorry, I had to question. I'm being vulnerable right now to you. My dad passed away. I know, but my dad passed away. My dad passed away last year, and he didn't get to reunite with my family. I don't want to disturb you, but at the same time, I just want to see if you, I can get a commitment from you, Senator. This is my life and the life of millions in the line. I just need to hear from you. Can we get a commitment from you to get a path with citizenship through the Bosque of Reconciliation to protect me and millions like me? Can I get a commitment from you? I think she nodded no. You said you don't want to respond. Thank you for your time. No, no, no. no you keep playing it because this is so ninja. It was so disturbing what she did. Listen to what the stewardess had to say to her afterwards. This is how disturbing this whole thing was. Actually, the answer is no. Somebody did not help her. No. In fact, uh, her senator didn't even uh, could barely look at her. And yet now the only story is, is this too mean? Is this too rude? Is this bullying? Yeah. I mean, cinema, I, I would imagine she was trying to book it for the airport uh, or the airplane restroom, but maybe the fasten seat belt site was on, so she couldn't make that escape this time. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I mean, like, I, I know that um, even the senators that perform kindness or perform like they're listening to their constituents, that they don't necessarily care, right? But cinema obviously doesn't care and doesn't care to even pretend that she cares. She's like, I, you know, I got, I got Candy Crush to do. I've got Downton Abbey to watch. I've got all these things to do on my iPad. Like, I'm not even going to listen to you. Like, she feels incredibly entitled to sit at the front of the plane and imagine maybe she's in business class or something. It's a... Yeah. The of course, she has to come to the front to talk to her. The anti-humanity of, um, of AirPods, as Chatter pointed out, like, it, it really is, like, you can put the face mask on. You can really, like, lock yourself away from any sort of outside uh, uh, um, influence from your constituents, which is nice for Kristen. And, right. and, you know, here's the thing, is that she could have said something to the effect of, like, look... I can't commit to the reconciliation bill right now because I have other issues with it. But no, I mean, the, I'm but just I mean, I'm talking like, you here is like you how you can give a right. non-answer yeah. and just recognize the humanity of the person standing next to you. I can't commit to that right now. I definitely um, uh, want to do something to help people like yourself and your grandfather. And uh, I'm working on it and I'm trying to figure out the best passage w pathway there. And so Joe Manchin approach, and, but and, I hear you and I see you and I, uh, and now if you'll let me, I've got to get back to my iPad. Right. I appreciate your coming by. And that's all that needed to happen there. Yes. But she is. Um, and, and, and yet we are, we are to believe that somehow a woman walking up to her on a plane has is is going to be some type of reason why you know some example of how america is broken or how uh she's going to be forced into a corner or some other garbage like this i mean it really is um amazing and to watch like all of the uh you know the 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 pearl clutchers on twitter or the ones on Twitter saying like, oh, can you imagine if this happened to AOC? Let's see if we can imagine if something like this happened to AOC. I mean, the fact of the matter is, <laughs> I mean, m make no mistake about it. This happens to AOC all the time. It's just that the people don't come in with a video camera because uh, they're not interested in actually trying to move politics. And her constituents just are moving. happy with what she's done for her district. The difference is that Arizona, Arizonans like the uh, DOC recipient 
who went up to her there. I believe she's from Arizona. I think they were on a plane from Arizona, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, she is expressing her disconnect content with her representative. There's a reason why the Capitol Police will send um, representatives to provide protection for AOC. It is because more often than not, when those type of exchanges happened, they're not polite and or or reading off a statement about immigration they're coming up and they're swearing at her they're telling her they're saying all sorts of nasty things and they're not videotaping it because they don't want to get in trouble and i'm sick of, and i'm right and i'm sick of divorcing the like substance of the conflict or the um uh, the, the way in which the protest, the protest uh, uh, and the activism is happening from the like manner in which it is yeah, happening. The, the content from the form. Why are we always focused on can this form yes. be like allowed? Where it, the content of it is clearly like the thing we need to focus on, which is they're righteous. The people that were going to like the Capitol on Jan 6 weren't. <laughs> Right, exactly. And that makes it entirely different. Plus, no one here is threatening cinema's life or safety or, uh, you know, or alluding, taunting her personally. Alluding universe. to sexual assault I mean, of her. That's what happens to Ocasio-Cortez. Let's uh, let's uh, put up uh, uh, put up this. This is the only video that we have of someone, you know, trying at least to, uh, to harass. And this is not about harassing Krista Cinema, right? It is about trying to get her to um, to take a position on something that has material implications for that person. But play this clip just in case people forgot. This happened in May of 2019. Uh, I think this just resurfaced in May. We don't know when in 2019 okay. it happened. 2019. May, May of last year, I think it came out, or this year it came out. Put this up. You want to talk to Crazy Ocasio? You come to this little thing and you open it up and you whisper confession into her. Session. This is confession. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is Ocasio Confession. Right on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I'm an American citizen. I pay your salary through the taxes that you collect from me through the IRS because I'm a tax-paying citizen of the United States. I'm a woman, I'm a female business owner, and I'm proud to be an American woman. And I do not support your socialist policies, and I do not support your murderous abortion policies. As a mother of three children, I'm appalled at New York's law for abortion, and it needs to end and it needs to stop now. You're bringing God's judgment on our country, and I'm against it, as well as my friends. So you need to stop being a baby. Uh, and stop we were having fun, Mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. They were like, well, we, we got a few drinks before we decided to do a little tour of here, and you're making a bit about abortion. Make it serious. I love how she yeah. can go from a person who doesn't know that a congresswoman doesn't make the laws for their state to being a congresswoman. Yeah, right. That's and, pretty good. And by the way, just so people don't, uh, if in case they're confused, Marjorie Taylor Greene did not reside in New York 14 at that time. So it's a bit different. No, but she has the right to, uh, you know, sp sp um, sputter those inanities through that mail slot if they want. Sure, but what sure. What she's saying is obviously like, very silly. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, let's take a, a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to Aaron Kleinman, director of research for the States Project at Future Now. Got a couple of sponsors of the program today, ladies and gentlemen. First off, you may be surprised to know this, but when you're in an incognito mode on your phone, it does not hide your activity. What? No. Nope. Bad news, guys. Oh, boy. Yep. Doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history. Your internet service provider can still see every single website you've ever visited. That's bad news when I search uh, for blackmail on you at this office. <laughs> that, that's one of the things, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why even when I'm at home or when uh, you are, you should never go online, and I certainly don't, uh, without using ExpressVPN. Super easy, folks. ExpressVPN is an app. It reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers, so your ISP... Internet service provider can't see the sites you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. ExpressVPN runs seamlessly in the background. It is so easy to use. All you got to do, you tap one button and boom, you're protected. ExpressVPN is available on all your, all your devices, your phones, your computers, 
even your smart TV, if you want to basically project that you're in a different region, maybe for a certain streaming service. I'm not going to say, but protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by CNET. You can visit our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash majority. That's express vpn.com slash majority and you can get an extra three months of free with a one-year package that's e-x-p-r-e-s-s vpn.com slash majority express vpn.com slash majority also uh i think it's not hard to see you read uh, forbes you read whatever it is gyms nail salons hotels mom and pop stores more are set to go on an epic hiring spree in the coming months to meet up the pent-up demand for all of those activities we've been shutting down during uh covid we're getting there um i can't wait <laughs> i can't you know what i can't wait to do is go to a movie oh yeah I still won't go. I've to only one. done one a few months ago, and it was like now I'm itching. Getting and to, get to see some music, live music. I mean, oh, I know yeah. some people are doing some of that, but I'm not ready to do that. But eventually, all of these businesses are going to reopening, are going to reopen, and that means that millions of jobs are going to be need to be filled. So, where do these businesses turn to fill these roles fast? If they're smart. It's ZipRecruiter, and right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com/majority. As you know, Brendan, we found through ZipRecruiter, a great hire. And Bradley is almost like, it's, well, it's downstream from the Brendan hire. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the child. Like you're almost like a, the grandchild of a ZipRecruiter hire or something. I can't figure out exactly the but uh, the family tree here. But the bottom line is you post a job on ZipRecruiter. What they do is they send your job to over 100 job sites so it gives you access to their network of millions of job seekers. And then ZipRecruiter's matching technology scans resumes to find qualified candidates for your open roles and proactively presents them to you. You can easily review recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job. And that, of course, encourages them to apply faster. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. At this exclusive web address, ziprecruiter.com slash majority. That's ziprecruiter.com slash M A J O R I T Y majority. Just go to ziprecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter, it is the smartest way to hire. And lastly, today, I put into Saul's lunch a cut up Korean pear. I think it's called a Hosea pear mm -hmm. from a tree that I planted last year. Wow. Yes. I got like somewhere between a half a dozen to a dozen of those. They are delicious. And it's fun th for a kid to eat a tree, you know, eat a, um, a piece of fruit that from a tree that he grew. He, yeah. he helped me dig the, the hole. I mean, uh, I would love it if he could actually just dig the hole. But, um, and here's the thing. A lot of times you think, when's the best time to plant a tree? When do you think? Uh, I, oh, I think spring. Yes. But Everybody no. thinks spring. But no? Fall. Fall is actually uh, the best time. Spring, early spring is the second best time. Mm. And the best tree to plant so that come next spring... You got the best shot of getting some fruit. If it's a fruit tree, you want to see it blossom. If it's a flower tree or you want to see it grow, fast growing trees. You skip the big box store. You head to fastgrowingtrees.com. It is the world's largest online nursery. No more waiting in lines. No messy cars, no digging through a lackluster selection. Just go to fastgrowingtrees.com and choose from thousands of varieties of trees, shrubs, and plants expertly curated to thrive in your area and delivered to your door in one or two days. Doesn't matter if you're looking for shade, privacy, fruit trees, or just added color for your yard. Every plant shipped with a well-developed root system ready to explode with new growth. That's the thing. The trees aren't, they don't grow faster. 
they have already grown. They're already, they're as big of a tree as you can get online. And when they're that developed, when you put them in the ground, they just take off. Fall is planting season. Don't let anybody tell you different. Join over 1 million satisfied gardeners at fastgrowingtrees.com plus the 30-day alive and thrive guarantee means your plants will arrive happy, healthy, and ready for planting. Now through November 30th, go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash majority for 15% off. That's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash majority, fastgrowingtrees.com slash majority. All right. I want to welcome back to the program Aaron Kleinman. He's the director of research for the state's project at Future Now. Oof. Seriously? Uh, uh, do you see there's a big game going on tonight? Hey, dude, are you seriously wearing a Yankee shirt uh, tonight? <laughs> oh, I, 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 you know, you live in New York. I, I had always thought that you were a Yankees fan, Sam. <laughs> I remember Bucky Dent hitting that home run in 1978. Maybe we need to uh, maybe we need to do this audio only. Uh, Aaron, uh, welcome to the program, Aaron Kleinman. Oh, good to be here. Thank you for having me, Sam. No? I thought uh, yeah. I thought Sam was about to be a true Bostonian and threaten violence upon you, Aaron, with uh, w w when he was teeing up that that, that comment there. Well, I will I say this: I'm not forgetting this. Let's put it this mm. way. All right. Occasionally, we see each other on the street, and so uh, I'm just, you should, you should be aware. Um, I mean, I'll be surrounded by uh, Yankees fans, so, you know. Well, all right. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, you should um, have seen Suns Out, Guns Out. You can take them. Yeah. You can take them. Just kidding. All right. Not, not really. All right. Um, all right. So, Aaron, um, mm -hmm. sorry about that distraction. I just, that was not what I was anticipating. It's, people usually dress appropriately when they come on the show. Um <laughs> Uh, let's talk Virginia. What, when is the, uh, we've got a big election. Why is Virginia an important state to look at? Just ge generically speaking, uh, you know, uh, why is Virginia an important state? Yeah. So, um, Virginia is only one of two states that has state legislative elections this year. The other being New Jersey, though that's pretty safely in democratic hands. But in Virginia in 2019, Democrats flipped the House uh, of Delegates there by just 2,000 votes. Uh, if 2,000 votes had changed hands, they wouldn't have flipped the House of Delegates. Uh, they have a five-seat majority now. That shows you just how you know tight st these state legislative races are. Um, and so heading into 2020, for the first time in a very long time, Virginia had a legislative majority that was focused on improving people's lives. Um, and so if you look at kind of the things that we're arguing about right now in Washington, D.C., uh, in Virginia, they've accomplished a lot of them already. You talk, want to talk about voting rights? Uh, in Virginia, they passed automatic voter registration. They um, made it a lot easier to vote early or absentee. You want to talk about, um, you know, investing in children, you know, or having this fight about the child tax credit. You know, they are they expanded um, really school lunch and school breakfast programs. Um, you want to talk about prescription drug prices. They capped the price of insulin. So you're talking about this legislative majority that really has been working to improve people's lives. Um, and so you're heading into 2021 and you're in a different political climate where, you know, during when Trump was president, you saw voters really energized to oppose his brand of politics for coming out a lot more. Uh, since he lost, the people that are believing kind of the radical right wing's big lie about 2020, they are getting really energized too. And so if you look at Virginia, um, it, you know, it's a little nerve wracking because all of those people are coming out to vote while you know, people who would support kind of, again, these, these candidates who are really improving people's lives, maybe a little complacent. So uh, we're really working hard to uh, energize those voters, get them out in, you know, these next four weeks uh, to vote in Virginia. And polls have things really tight. They have the gubernatorial candidate ahead slightly, but in Virginia, um, state legislative candidates tend to underperform the top of the ticket on the Democratic side. So it, it, it has been nerve wracking. The majority is at risk. I'm sorry, did you say they, they tend to underperform or overperform? Underperform. Uh, you know, typically in Virginia, they've run a few points behind the gubernatorial nominee. And wasn't Virginia, uh, wasn't there, uh, uh, and just to add to sort of like, I mean, as we sort of tease out this dynamic of, of enthusiasm, 
Wasn't Virginia one of the, um, wasn't there a county in Virginia where like a lot of the c critical race theory stuff was happening um, it, it down there? I mean, isn't there, or is, is that right or, or do I have that mistaken? No, you're correct. Uh, Loudoun County, which is, um, uh, you know, you and I remember the Bush era. All the former George W. Bush staffers moved to Loudoun County um, and they created kind of an astroturf movement to um, make this into a big issue. Um, but I think it kind of just shows how the radical right is really seizing on these non-issues to try to energize their voters. And you, you can see that there. You can see it with the big lie. Um, you know, if you look at the Republican candidates in Virginia, um, you know, you have one person who is a member of the big lie legal team. He's running for the House of Delegates as a Republican. He's in a safe Republican seat. He's going to be in the House of Delegates next year, you know, almost certainly. And, you know, it's a real peril to democracy that, um, you know, th these kind of flim flammers might have a majority, might have subpoena power. So, I mean, has there been any, I, I think, reckoning with or understanding of how to activate negative partisanship going into this race in the way that perhaps Newsom did in the California recall. Now it's a little different because you can draw a direct connection with like, oh, we're going to be undemocratic here, just like the January Sixers were and just like the Trump administration is. But I would imagine there's a way to take some lessons from what happened in California a few weeks back. Yeah, and you know, I think one other parallel to California is that uh, Newsom was really aided by the fact that he made it easier for people to vote. And so in Virginia, we're seeing, you know, it's easier to vote early, it's easier to vote absentee. So hopefully that'll help as well. In terms of activating negative partisanship, I think a big issue right now is similar to what uh, Newsom uh, had was uh, on vaccines. And, um, you know, the Democratic ticket in Virginia is supportive of, you know, vaccine mandates, especially for people like healthcare workers. And the Republican ticket is not. And, you know, so I think you're seeing that as well there. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, obviously, to the extent that a, you know a Republican candidate in a marginal area can be tied to Trump, um, you know it harms them among uh, median voters, especially in a state like Virginia. But you know it also our candidate, you know people don't just want to hear Trump, Trump, Trump all the time. They want to have kind of a positive vision for the future. And thankfully in Virginia, you know we have candidates who have been working to improve the lives of people in the Commonwealth. And it's just they need to get that message out. I mean, that's really the, the issue right now that you're know, getting it through the din. You know, it, it's it can be so hard to cut through kind of clutter coming out of D.C., especially in a state like Virginia. So uh, that's the challenge right now. All right. I, I want to dig into this this dynamic because I am increasingly convinced that the that turnout is going to be a function of that negative partisanship. I mean, I, I, I do think, obviously, you need to have uh, a, a positive vision. But I think that's just sort of like baseline. That's like basically like I need signatures to get on the ballot. Um, after that, um, there needs to be, particularly from the center to the left, it seems to me, it is driven by, by um, and I think it's the, the case on the, on the right, but like you say, they always figure out what it is they're going to run against. And it's, and, and, and more often than not, it's make believe, right? I mean, it's yeah. going to be, uh, you, you, you know, you got to get out there and vote because otherwise everybody's going to be, they're going to be teaching our kindergartners critical race theory. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 it could have been, they're going to be teaching our kindergartners, you know, trigonometry, <laughs> but black trigonometry or something. You know, it has to have like some uh, sort of racial component to it. But they will, uh, they're getting their people out. And, and I look at things like there was... Um, abortion protests around the country. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was barely on my radar. Um, and I don't know how many ultimately there were I, the, or how, how big they were, but they were not, they were not like the days after the Trump administration. And we're doing this in the wake of what's happening in Texas. We're doing this as uh, there are uh, a more like a, like a head on assault on uh, Roe v. Wade at the Supreme Court. And yet and yet uh, we're you know, we're not quite seeing that mobilization. How much of like the enthusiasm gap um, do you think is real? And, it, you know, wh wh what do you do to combat that? 
Yeah. yeah. No, um, I think there is a bit of an enthusiasm gap right now just because uh, the radical right really is just so mobilized right now. But as you mentioned, you know, on health care, um, that, you know, that is an issue where we just saw the Supreme Court basically overturned Roe v. Wade. It's now, and you know what that means is that it now falls to state legislatures to protect uh, women's health care. In Virginia, in 2020, the legislative majority passed the Women's Health Act, uh, protecting that right. Uh, meanwhile, on the members of the Republican statewide ticket in Virginia this year are saying that they wanted they want to have a law similar to Texas. So, you know, it's a stark choice there. And so um, if you can return, you know, kind of pro women's health legislators to Richmond, you can continue protecting women's health care in that way. And there has been mobilization around that. I mean, I think comparing it to the women's march is a bit of a high bar. Right. But right. The fact that you were able to get a lot of people out and mobilize. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the state, they know the stakes. We're getting everyone on board. You know, I think, and there's a lot to be excited about here. And it's not, you know, in, in the, again, in the healthcare realm, it's not just that. It's also, you know, again, capping the price of insulin. They're really focusing on making it so that Virginians can get the healthcare that they need. And so um, there is mobilization around that. There, I think, you know, Trump, I, as you mentioned, kind of hangs over everything. I think, yes, that is a way to uh, have that negative uh, partisanship mobilization, which is really important, as you said. But it can't just be that. You can't let that overwhelm your message. And so it's a, it's a delicate balance. But, you know, again, we have all these great issues to get people excited on because of all the great work that they've done. And it's just getting that message out there. That's the key. How much is um, how much does the the anti-vaccine max uh, mandates and anti-masking how much does that come into play because i know on one hand it motivates and we have piece right here um the the other day about the uh, Koch brothers or i guess not the not the brothers anymore but uh, uh the coke the coke network. network um uh you know funding a lot of this anti-mask anti-vaccine stuff because they see it as something, you know, that motivates people to go out and vote. Um, it just gets them angry and they go out and vote. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> what do you got going on there? So, you, so you're kidding. I'm vacuuming. So. Oh, all right. uh, yeah, that's no, okay. That's um, a, um, I mean, h- how much is McAuliffe like running against that? How much are the assembly, you know, the... The uh, 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 assembly people or the delegates, delegates, rather, how much are they running against that? Like how much how 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 forefronted is that? Uh, Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a big issue. It's the front of everyone's minds. I think actually at the start of the year, everyone thought that school openings would be a big issue. Like, um, you know, kind of radical. Right. If you look at kind of what the Cokes were doing then, it wasn't so much masks and mandates. It was school openings. Well, hey, guess what? Um, Virginia, you know, they had they've done a pretty good job vaccinating people. They're able to keep schools open. um, And so they need a new kind of, uh, you know, boogeyman type issue uh, on their end. And so they're ter- and so they're trying to make masks and mandates that. Um, and again, you have a uh, you know, legislative majority in Virginia right now that supports basic public health measures. And I think this election will really be a test of, you know, can, you know, are, are, are the people who are just so motivated by hatred of basic public health measures, are there, you know, they're, they might be a minority, but are they kind of just motivated enough to overwhelm people who do support them? Um, you know, again, it's really just comes down to we really need to get kind of the sensible people to the polls there. Virginia. And and are, are I mean, what what is the next thing? Is it, is it going to be mask mandates and, and, and vaccines? Like, I mean, how are they? Because I guess I'm asking not just for Virginia now, but if if we get on the stay on the same trajectory with um, with covid and we don't have another variant, which who knows um like what what are they going to lean on at that point i mean is it going to go back to crt it feels like the 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 critical race theories thing is sort of um are are has you know run out like there's only so many times you can ban crt from your schools and it's sort of like you're i don't know um 
you're, you're, you're just shadow boxing. And at one point you just you tie yourself out with that. Cause there's nobody hitting back. There's nobody going like, we need to have these critical race theories, uh, you know, taught to our, our, our third graders, or we're going to have to rewrite the books. I mean, what, what, where do you think they go from here? I think it goes back to the animating fear behind all of this. And it is fear, you know, I think it's not just a fear, but really the knowledge that they have a very unpopular political program that is not supported by a majority of this country. Um, and so it's whipping their base into a fear of the fact that the majority of the country, you know, doesn't think like them. And it's really goes back to the big lie. And it goes back to actually the election was stolen. It goes back to we need to do whatever possible to really uh, fight representative democracy in this country. Um, and that's really, that's the end goal. Like they know they're not supporting a political program that a majority of people can support. What the, what they have to go, they have to go kind of just animate their base through fear, hoping that an anti-majoritarian system will allow them to stay in power because that will to power is the thing that binds them together right now. And so what we need to do, and, and again, that effort to really undermine democracy runs through state legislatures. Uh, the Supreme Court has said as much. They have, they are inventing a doctrine that, you know, basically might say in 2024, a state legislature can annul the uh, result of the presidential race in the state. Um, so state legislatures are going to be the key background, not just this in the next month in Virginia, but 2022 everywhere for protecting democracy, because the legislators who are sworn in in early 2023 are going to be the ones who could potentially uh, decide whether people's votes are going to count in 2024. I, I want to get in a little bit to, to the specific candidates that you guys have, you know, are, are, are looking at. But do you think that on a national level, I mean, if it's the case, right, that they're going to push uh, the 2020 thing uh, and, 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 and it sure feels like that's what Donald Trump wants to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, very hard, even for the Republicans, it seems to me, to sort of like contain him. Does it make sense for the Democrats at that point? And, and this can be both a specific question and a general question to really push the January 6th hearings as a mechanism in which to forefront Trump, because I really do think there's a, a unique opportunity for Democrats here and that they don't have to think too hard about who to run against in, in an off year election. Like generally. The reason why parties that are out of power do well in an off year election is because they can run against the party that is in power and because the party in power is everybody's conscious of it. Right. I mean, it's not like, um, uh, you know, Bill Clinton could run against uh, George Herbert Walker Bush in his midterm uh, after, you know, George, but but really, the Democrats could run against Trump to some extent in their midterm. And that's an opportunity they've never had before. And it seems to me, you know, Trump animates voters. How much does both, I guess both from a specific sense, but also a general sense, how much, because you focus on state elections, how much does what the Democrats do on a national level, setting certain narratives, how much does that bring people out during a midterm election for those state elections? Or even the off year, even 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 in November when we don't even have, they're not with the federal elections. No, um, you know the number one predictor of whether a state legislative candidate is going to win their seat is whether their party's presidential candidate carried the seat. So, you know the national, you know elections across the country have been nationalized, um, and you know people are aware of that. And again, you know we are seeing these, you know people who are involved with the big lie running for office at the state level especially in state legislatures, who, again, are going to be the people determining that. So to the extent that we can make the assault on democracy like salient in people's minds, um, that is really you know, critical to putting that front and center um, in, in voters' minds as well and making that threat. It's like, you know, democracy is on the ballot in Virginia next month everywhere in 2022 and you know again through you know specials and odd year elections you know basically um for a very for the foreseeable future um and so that you know we have to be mindful of that um and yeah so i mean again that is something that we all have to be very mindful of going forward uh in terms of redistricting <laughs> in terms of redistricting um what what's what what's it looking like in terms of redistricting uh, these days 
Um, um, I, I know there's only a couple of states that have come out exactly with their redistricting. We've got um, uh, Texas is sort of going to town for the Republicans, and Oregon is sort of, you know, mirroring Texas, but for the Democrats, I guess. Um, what's what's the what's the status from your perspective? Um, you know, I, I think right now it's still pretty early on. Um, right now, I think what, what I talked about earlier, kind of the, the, the fear of the majority is really manifesting itself where what you saw in 2010 was a lot of kind of these right wing legislators betting on themselves, betting on, hey, I can keep winning marginal districts. Um, in a, especially in a midterm environment. Um, what they're doing now is really just trying to, you know, put up a wall around their voters and try, you know, they're not, they're trying to make as many safe districts as possible instead of spreading themselves thinly. Because I think they, you know, if you look at the demographic trends in this country, um, every year based solely on kind of who turns 18 and who uh, passes away, Democrats gain around 500,000 votes in you know, kind of the national, you know, that that's keeping going. Republicans, you know, the radical right is not making any gains among younger voters. Um, and their base is increasingly, uh, you know, older and, you know, not growing. And so re redistricting is reflecting that, that when they have the power, they're trying to just kind of consolidate as much as they can in preparation for minority rule. So if, if I understand you correctly, we're not going to see, and part of that is a function of like, it's already been gerrymandered so much that there's only so much more you can do, but we're not going to see the gerrymandering focus on, you know, picking up m more seats necessarily. Uh, at least that's not going to be the major thrust. It's really going to be like, we're going to, we're going to, it's almost like a fortress redistricting. Yeah. I mean, that's, what's been so far. I, you know, I wouldn't say that that might not be the case everywhere. I mean, you still have states like Florida or uh, North Carolina, where they might want to get aggressive and really draw uh, aggressive, you know, really kind of spread themselves uh, out there. And also Florida is a state where is one of the few states where uh, they actually gained, uh, they actually gained vote share from 2016 to 2020. Um, and so, but yeah, the overall, the trend right now is just, you know, kind of protect what you have um and you know kind of rely on and and i think a lot of what they've done so far is that you know if you look at the, what the radical right's done since biden was elected they've done very little to try to appeal to the median voter they don't obsess over the median voter the way that uh democrats do mm -hmm. what they are really focused on is making it so that um the median voter doesn't matter as much and their base is what really matters and you're seeing that in redistricting. all right so uh if people want to I don't know. Uh, help uh, Virginia stay blue. Um, and I got to say, I uh, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who found Terry McAuliffe more distasteful than I the the first time he ran for governor. Um, in all in all fairness, he he actually did I think like a fairly respectable job. You know, maybe against him, you know, I'm basing it against him, but he was not the Terry McAuliffe that I thought he would be. I thought he was a, you know, pretty decent uh, governor in terms of just bringing material benefits to people in Virginia. Um, what, what, uh, but, but talk about the other candidates that you guys are, are, are looking at. And, and I guess be, even before you do that, wasn't it the case also around this time that Northrop, um, when he was running for, I don't know if it was re-election or election the first time, it looked like the race was tightening, but there was still like a, you know, um, uh, the, 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 that the polling sort of sometimes looks a little closer than it is in Virginia? You know, yeah, I'm, you know, right. So McAuliffe has had a slight lead in all the polling that uh, has been out there. Um, or most of it, there might have been a few aberrant ones here and there. And, you know, I think in general, he's the slight favorite again. Um, and again, like I said, you know, so, and also in the, in the gubernatorial race, he's, you know, he's running against this private equity, uh, you, you know, guy who, you know, kind of like a, a mini Mitt Romney trying to be like Trump. Uh, that's his opponent. But, you know, there's a lot of money in the gubernatorial race right now. But where there isn't a lot is, you know, if you look at these state legislative campaigns that we're running, and, you know, we've really endorsed nine candidates in the state who are gonna, in the districts that are probably going to be the difference. Um, those campaigns, 
they're going to spend something like 1% of what like an Amy McGrath would spend. These are very, they're close races and they don't really cost that much. And if you want to talk about delivering material benefits to people, McAuliffe did what he could with, you know, when he was governor, the legislature was controlled by the radical right. Um, so, you know, there's only so much you can do through executive actions. Um, like, you know, he did a lot of clemency stuff, for example. Uh, but if he actually has a legislature that can work with him on improving people's lives, then again, you could see the progress that they may continue. For example, like I said, it had been a long time since the Virginia House of Delegates was controlled by people who are focused on improving lives. Um, they went from one of the worst states in the education spending to per pupil. Now they're like in the middle of the pack. And that's just in two years. Like, you know, when you talk about education spending, it's very hard to go from zero to 60 that quickly. And so you can, you can see them continue to make that progress in those areas. And, you know, Virginia, because again, two years of unified government under people who want to improve lives. It was recently named, like one of those, um, I forget who, they, they named it one of the best, the best place, state in America to do business in, not because of low taxes, the way that those places normally do, in the state like Texas, Florida, but because they have great human development there as well. And because they're, they have a government that's focused on not on really fostering an environment where people can thrive. And that's, you know, I think McAuliffe would love to have the chance to do that again. And um, like I, you know, uh, I'll, I'll avoid any further comment on him, but I really just want to focus on the fact that give him a legislature that can actually pass those laws that can improve lives. And again, those are small races with small margins and that they're not that expensive. So if you go to statesproject.org, we have our Give Smart program where you can send money directly to the nine candidates who are going to be the difference between majority and minority in the state. Um, give, what's that website again? Uh, statesproject.org. That's our uh, new website for our states pro project initiative. That's really uh, we're, we're using that to help people focus on state legislatures and you know just show them just how important they are. And my understanding is that every time somebody goes to uh, statesproject.org. Uh, you uh, you take one of those disgusting shirts that you're wearing and you go and you throw them out. Is that right? <laughs> Tell you what, um, if if um, there is no Bucky Dent moment, if, and I want uh, that hat also uh, behind you over there. Yeah. I want that thing gone. Uh, you should see the side of it. It's. Uh, you know. <laughs> I like that Nets hat though. That's a nice little baby blue. I need one of those. Oh, like oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a Nets hat down here as well. Uh, Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know that I'm, I'm bummed that they went to the black and the white. Uh, but yeah, no, I tell you what, Sam, if, uh, the Yankees, uh, don't, they, if they can't win in Fenway, maybe I'll wear a Red Sox hat the next time I come on the show. But again, for now, holding you that, but, holding yeah. you to the, he all said, right. maybe you said, maybe well, That's I'm not saying a definitely. Commitment. Well, all right, all right. Well, in the meantime, uh, again, check out statesproject.org. Um, or you can follow me on Twitter at Bobby Big Will because I tweet about uh, the Virginia House of Delegates all the time, uh, in addition to other stuff. But that's my focus for the next month. And uh, those are the places where you can see the Give Smart program. And again, if you want to make a political donation right now, those are the nine candidates for whom your donations go the furthest. Because like I said, in 2019, the difference between a state legislature that was going to improve lives and one that didn't, it was just 2,000 votes switching across the state. That's nothing. And again, these candidates, they spent, again, 1% of what Amy McGrath spent is what, you know, the most expensive of these races is going to be. So you're talking about a little bit goes a long way in these races. Aaron Kleinman, Director of Research for the States Project at Future Now. Thanks so much for your time today. Really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sam. And okay. um, thanks, Aaron. sorry in advance for tonight as far as you're concerned. Bye. 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 We'll see. Yeah, we will. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and uh, we'll be right back. we got a couple of things to talk about before we uh, wrap this up. We'll be right back after this.
All right, we're back. Uh, folks, before we, uh, we've still got a couple of times here. A couple. <laughs> we've got a couple of minutes here. A little bit of time. I want to talk about this. Um, so during the Trump years, the um, Congress passed a law to get rid of surprise billing. What is surprise billing? It is this um, weird situation, which I think really probably only exists in this country. Um, I don't know. Maybe it exists in other countries. I can't imagine how. Um, where you go to the hospital that you think you're covered by your insurance. That's why you went to that hospital. I got to go to the emergency room. I go there. I'm covered. And my insurance covers it. You're there in the emergency room. In fact, this happened to me. I think years ago, I think I, I, people might remember me talking about this, driving in the car uh, with my then ex-wife. We're going to, to like a, some type of thing to check out a, a junior high for uh, our daughter because in, in New York City, you got to go like all through the district to look at anyways. And uh, I'm feeling a little pain right here. My ex is talking to her mom, who's a nurse. She's like, you got to go right <laughs> to the emergency room. Well, to uh, like, you know, urgent care or something like that. You and know, one of those places. Heartburn or something like that. I, I, I didn't know. And I was just like, but once you get it in your head, you're like, yeah. I got to go. Right. And, and it was a weird pain. I had never had anything like that. So I went there. And of course, they 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 just basically say like, oh, you got to go to the emergency room. And then, you know, you got to pay him. Went to the emergency room. I was there for eight hours. Got in at like, you know, 730. And I'm there until four in the morning. And they give me an EKG right when I get there and this and that. And so, and then I'm like, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go to work, I, you know, in, in, in four hours or something. And so I pay for the emergency room bill. I don't know. I, I did, I'm just making up these numbers. I don't remember exactly. It was like $1,000. Yeah. And, and my insurance covered part of it. But then months later, I get a collection bill. I get a collection notice. Surprise. Surprise. Medical bill. From the doctor that looked at me there. And so I called up and I'm like, I already paid this bill. And they're like, no, that was for the emergency room. You didn't pay the bill for the doctor. And this is why we call it a surprise. And I'm like, wait a second. What, what if I just showed up at the emergency room and nobody looked at me? Like, I just walked through the door. You're going to charge me? Like, well, that's the way we do it. The doctor's not on your plan. And this is to deal with those type of things. And apparently, um, and so the, um, the Biden administration put a part one rule out. They uh, issued that. Um, and now they've just issued part two. The part one essentially put a cap on what you can be charged by a doctor out of your who, who has given you care in a place that you think that you're covered by by the insurance puts a cap on what they can charge relative to what your insurance would get charged right apparently rule two this is the second major rule the Biden administration has released uh before the law takes effect in 2022 um basically sets up a mechanism in which your health insurance company negotiates with the provider. This is such a, like, this is, it is the, the only thing I can, uh, our, our medical <laughs> delivery system and payment system is so messed up. It's like, you have a choice. We've got a, a hill in front of us. We're building a road and we want to get to the other side of that hill or mm -hmm. mountain. We can, blow a hole through the middle of our tunnel, or what we can do is create a series of rickety uh, ramps and stairs slides, and rope ladders and zip slides lines. and zip lines <laughs> and get to get to the other side. And that's what's going on here. I mean, it is- wear a really expensive outfit while you do it too, but you probably have to pay for that still. As can't, many- We can't make it the free one. As many as one in five emergency room visits result in a surprise um, a billing charge. And the rate of the surprise billing is similar for a, for women giving birth. Yeah, well, we're looking at the same New York Times piece. And like the, a, a Pennsylvania woman was once billed $50,000 for 
for an out of network air ambulance transport in between hospitals, which she was surprised by. What the Times says surprise. essentially that you, the patients are in the middle of a dispute between a doctor and an insurer. They disagree on the fair price for a given medical service. And the new rule released on Thursday lays out how newly hired billing arbiters. So now you've got to create a whole nother sort of like cohort of bureaucrats to figure out the pricing uh, here. And they will decide who in those fights is right. Under the federal law, both the insurer and the doctor will tell an arbiter what they believe the appropriate price for a service should be. The arbiter will then look at a variety of factors to decide which of the two rates to pick. Now understand, if we were under a single payer system, this would happen essentially once. <laughs> Not in different municipalities and different counties and different states across the country, it would happen once a year maybe, maybe once every couple of years, where um, a Medicare for all system would determine this is the value of this service, this is the value of that service based upon outcomes and based upon uh, what it costs and this and that. Everything would be simplified. But now we have to create another cohort to deal with the middleman insurance provider that uh, is determining rates. And so you have to have like a whole separate process to regulate said rates via hospitals and the insurance. This it's is like, insane. this is like, if you remember during the ACA and they still have them, they had to develop a whole network of, of navigators these are community service agencies that exist that will then help you sign up for what you're eligible uh, for and determine what your eligibility is on the exchanges. Like, we create all of these mechanisms, and it is to protect the profits on the other of hand, medical providers. It's also uh, job creation, so. We, we could also cre we could create jobs in having a Medicare for all. It's just we wouldn't have to have so many different ones just to protect uh, the profits of these insurers and these medical uh, care providers. It's nuts. It is nuts. But maybe we'll get some expanded Medicare benefits in this reconciliation package if President Manchin and President Cinema feel we are worthy of it. But we will have to wait and see. Um, that's it for us today. If you're watching us on Peacock, we will see you tomorrow. If you're watching us or listening to us by any other mechanism, we're still here and we're going to head into the fun half. And joining us for the fun half today will be Nomiki Konst. And, uh, but first, let me remind you, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can help us survive and thrive by becoming a member today. Go to jointhemajorityreport.com, and when you do, you not only get the uh, free half of the show, you get the fun half, and you help keep the show alive. Check it out, jointhemajorityreport.com. It is your support that makes this show possible. Also, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. You get 10% off. And uh, the Majority Discord. You okay? Yeah. Majority Discord. A pen, Over 4, 000, world gone wrong. 4,000 members of our Discord. Check that out. Um, and also, you can always IM the show by getting the app at majorityapp.com. Uh, Nomi! Hello. This time, I feel like it's two weeks in a row where your background is consistent. <laughs> Don't get too comfortable. I'm traveling next week. <laughs> oh, gosh. There we go. Um, what's happening this week on, on your show? Oh my God, we have such an incredible week. So, uh, we just started this deal with Rockfin. We're trying to shake it up and bring some, um, a diversity of opinions, uh, left opinions to the platform. And we have an exclusive with Tom Hartman tonight that airs at 8 PM at rockfin.com slash Nomi key. Uh, right. he's doing his whole, you know, the, the hidden histories, that series that he does, this one's on, uh, the healthcare system. So that's tonight at 8 p.m. And then tomorrow on Wednesday, uh, we have a crazy, like a packed show. Uh, we have Connor Town O'Neill, who's the author of Down Along with the Devil's Bones. Um, it's a reckoning with monuments, memory, and the legacy of white supremacy, as well as Natasha Hakimi Zapata, who uh, wrote an article titled How Rich Countries Can End Vaccine Apartheid, which is still happening. Um, very different conversations happening worldwide uh, than, than we're having here. 
and Rep. Rab, uh, Representative Rab from from Pennsylvania, who just put out a bill to troll the Republicans. It's kind of brilliant um, on all their reproductive rights attacks. And Arun Chowdhury, that's tomorrow on the Nomi Key Show. Yes. That's uh, awesome. That's just tomorrow? That's nuts. Well, Tom Hartman's tonight, and then tomorrow, well, we're two hours, and we like, you know, we have deep conversations. We're like, you know, like you. It's a, got a, a long conversation, but two times a week, youtube.com slash the Nomi Key Show, and of course, uh, over on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Join us! Because we're sending out lots of swag right now. So this is the time to become a patron. Ooh, what kind of swag? Um, well, uh, we have bags and stickers and mugs. Uh, it's just been sitting there. And I was like, you know, we might as well send it out. So Very sweet. Cool. It was back when we had live events. And then that like, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. I remember those days. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian universe? Uh, yeah, for patrons of Left Reckoning, we talked with Sam Holy Brill on the CRT panic, particularly James Lindsay and Chris Rufo. Chris Rufo, uh, just this morning, taking a, a, a victory lap as parents in Westchester County, New York, have forced the resignation of Lakeland School Superintendent Brendan Lyons, uh, who had been pushing critical race theory in the curriculum. And um, so, is that true? Was he actually pushing critical race theory in the curriculum? No, there was like, uh, he denied it. They got mad because he denied it, but there was some, something called like cultural responsive teaching or something. Ooh! And oh. I mean, this is, I think like not only is this going to be, in, the vaccine stuff isn't going to last to the midterms. Right. I think CRT is going to be the thing, but I think the, the CRT thing is going to develop into basically a fully elaborated white nationalist. Um, right, uh, right. It's just going to be CRT is actually going to end up meaning like three other things. Yeah, yeah. CRT means like, uh, I mean, I've said it before, like N-word lover. I think those people would have been saying 40, 40 years ago. Right, yeah. right. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break, head into the uh, fun half of the program. You can IM this show by going to majorityapp.com, getting the app, it's free, and then you IM us. Hmm. Simple, simple. Hmm. See you there. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. 
No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. It is the fun half. Um, no, mate. I know that you share in our abject horror and disgust at what uh, Kristen Cinema has been subjected to. I don't know if you saw the clip of the, um, the DACA recipient who I guess apparently was on the same flight as uh, Kristen Cinema and went up to her and asked her if she would commit in a conversation that probably lasted like, oh my God. Violence. 180 seconds. Sure violence um would you commit to protecting you know folks like me and my family in the reconciliation bill i mean it was hard to watch <laughs> um should have put a trigger warning at the beginning of the video to be honest and here is joe biden being incredibly callous about it uh he's asked about the the situation by peter Ducey. um at the White House uh, press conference, and, and Biden just doesn't care. <laughs> Play this clip. President, I, you're talking about how you have 48 Democratic votes right now. The other two uh, have been pressured over the weekend by activists. Joe Manchin had people on kayaks show up to his boat. He had oh. him. Senator Sinema last night was chased into a restroom. Pause it, pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. This guy is understating it because it wasn't Joe Manchin had people uh, riding up on, on kayaks to his boat. They rode up to his yacht. I just want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to have a kayak come up. Maybe it bumps into your like little 16 foot Boston whaler. Big deal. Yeah. But this guy, you put a dent in that, that yacht. That's going to, that's going to, that's going to cost. Two so Pinocchios go back. for exactly. Steve. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Manchin had people on kayaks show up to his boat. T.L. Adam, Senator Sinema last night was chased into a restroom. Do you oh. think that those tactics are crossing a line? I don't think they're appropriate tactics, but it happens to everybody. From the, <laughs> the only people it doesn't happen to are people who have Secret Service standing around them. Um, okay. So uh, it's, it's, it's part of the process. Yes. Sir. And then I love it. We're done. I loved it too. I mean, uh, like, I like that he didn't take the opportunity to scold activists, which I feel like he's done in the past. And by feel like, I mean, I know he's done in the past on the campaign trail. That that was helpful. And it also is probably indicative of his immense frustration with cinema. I mean, I think he appreciates activists making her feel the heat because... People need to understand the Biden administration is way more aligned with the progressives than he is with Mansion and Cinema and the Gottheimer crowd. Um, so, and then like another just quick point, Ducey of course asked that question as the Fox News provocateur reporter that's in uh, that's in the White House press corps. But it was being recirculated by a variety of right wing groups, like America <laughs> Rising and Jack Posobiec was like, oh, you know, going all in on it, right? The, just just an indication of right uh yeah, turning point is, usa the constellation well. of people who are coming to cinema's defense i think is very revealing of yeah. uh yeah the agendas there. the free speech first amendment warriors are not that into the speech being directed at cinema in order to pressure her on uh, her vote by well, her constituents it would be amazing for like normie Democrats in Arizona to use that as a weapon saying, you know, if this is some sort of appeal to win more conservatives over, these are not the conservatives that you're looking for, Kirsten Cinema. You know, if this is some sort of, I don't know what her game plan is. Like I'm literally, like I made a, a joke last night on Twitter saying, you know, is this some sort of like long-term altruistic plan to make normie Democrats hate centrists and thank you so much, you've done it um, and moving them to the left. Because I can't understand like, do they have something on her? She might lose her general election because of this. Forget about being primary from the left. She might lose her general election. 
Uh, let's take a look at some polling. I mean, maybe you just don't understand how to how to uh, you just don't get you political get strategy. You know, You're not playing forty thousand dimensional chess. Put up the uh, this is this uh, latest poll from Morning Consult. Uh, Kristen Cinema has lost from Q1 to Q3. For those who are not um, uh, literate in, uh, in uh, fractions, there is four quarters to a year. <laughs> we are in the third quarter. Um, she has lost overall with all voters, with all voters, 13% of uh, between her approval and disapproval. In, in Q1, her approval rate was 48%. Her disapproval was 35%. And now, 42% approve, 42% disapprove. Almost the same amount who don't know, no opinion. Uh, obviously, her support amongst Democrats has cratered. It was 67% approval. It is now 46% approval. Her disapproval numbers doubled over that time. And, and to be clear, this is also taken at a time where, my understanding is in Arizona, they have been inundated with ads yeah. supportive of her um, obstruction and claiming that she is fighting for all the things she's actually fighting against in the reconciliation bill. And so this doesn't get better for her after the vote is taken. This gets worse for her. Can you put that back up um, real quick? Because yep. I am more interested, not more interested, but I'm, I'm also interested in the independence because look at those numbers. I mean, oh. yeah, okay, a little bit more approval among Republicans, but that's not going to make up that difference. And who's going to organize for you? What, are you going to become a Republican? I mean, seriously, what is she going to do to keep that seat? If she becomes a Republican, she's not winning that seat. She yeah. has to She has to keep that coalition of independents, a couple of Republicans here and there. But I can tell you, like, I don't think that, that, that if you if you pulled, if, if you if you took this poll and you started getting into more, you know, okay, do you do you approve of her in general? Great. Do you approve of her tactics? I don't think Republicans would trust that. That's not Maverick tactic. And oh, even no, Republicans no. are There's saying Republican. here, and even if Republicans are saying here that they approve of her, right, and there's a slight uptick in increase, I don't think that translates to them going to the ballot box. Oh, of course not. Right. I mean, of course. I mean, you, you look at Democrats when uh, you know when McCain was thwarting the Republicans. His approval goes through the roof with them, of course. But as soon yeah. as, but that's a different thing. They approve of her as a Democrat. We like a Democrat who's not voting with the Democrats. Yes, of course. Her, she's underwater now with independence. She was, I mean, that is that is what's really devastating because that's supposedly her brand. That's the number. That's the number. So, so like, what is this about? Did they threaten her? I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I mean, in all honesty, like I cannot, unless she's absolutely out of her mind, and I'm not using that as a trope. As That's a woman, what it is. I'm saying literally, like to do this type of thing, to hold up a government, to sink your future p politically. She doesn't need to do this to get an MSNBC contract or a book deal or make millions or become a lobbyist. She was doing that already. She got that. What is it? Like, do they have something on her? Are they holding someone hostage? She's crazy. Get it. <laughs> there's part of that. that like, so there's something off. Um, I mean, like, maybe I shouldn't say that, but that's how I, I feel. Um, and also well, I think, look, I think without saying that, you can say her, she is untethered from any type of real political belief. I mean, yes. let's be clear. And untethered Ten from years even ago, wanting to get her colleagues to like her, which oftentimes can be incent an incentive, even if you're really? a Christian person, like, say, like, I don't know, Mark Warner, you, you still want to be able to work with your colleagues. She doesn't even care about that. And Ten she's years being chased ago. everywhere. It's physically uncomfortable now. It's a difference when the cameras are on you and you get to, t you know, I think Joe Manchin's playing that a little bit and he's really good at it because he's been doing it for a long time. But this isn't about her getting attention anymore. I mean, her life is uncomfortable. She, 10 years ago, I mean, you look at where she was 10 years ago with this stuff. I mean, it was dramatically different. She was protesting Joe Lieberman when he came to, and he was running for uh, president, I think, in 2003. She, she was out there protesting him. I mean, so I, you know, we're not uh, uh, psychiatrists. We can't tell, you know, uh, oh, wow. to say that she's got, but she is untethered 
from any type of political agenda. Yes. That is quite clear. I'm using crazy, like very loosely and colloquially, I guess. But there's just there's something, you know, I don't know. I She's she's working on on a different set of incentives and we can't even figure. And I think it's right. performance of, art. It's performance right. art. OK, it's, she's doing a documentary like remember that documentary? Uh, what's his name did? I'm where, not. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or the Green Party is just a uh, front for Republicans. <laughs> I don't know. Huh. I, I'm interested in uh, fishing up. around with the uh, possible explanations. Uh, was a plant. They should do a little more vetting, but um, uh, frankly, of their uh, of their <laughs> candidates. But I, I mean, I I what is clear is that there is no she is not operating with any type of predictable um, type of a set of incentives. The, the, her her incentive structure is completely um, obscured, and to the, the I mean there has to be you know one of uh, she has to have she has to be working on some incentive structure, but it's so obscured and so outside of the norm it's very hard to figure out like what you know and like what Ryan was saying the other day Ryan Grimm I mean I think that there's like she the. the, the we don't want to keep psychoanalyzing her, but like she seems to be operating under like a, a a bit of a different background in terms of like rushing herself through school and uh, being a bit of a prodigy, but also not being able to connect with people in a certain way and feeling spurned by patriarchy in this like fashion. And so I, I don't know. Um, but like uh, the fact that we're having to psychoanalyze her at this point is is a little bit little bit frustrating uh, there's nothing else to work from yeah I, I listen my bets are she's she's uh it's all it's all altruistic that's what it is she's just going to come out at the end and say all right guys you get what you want i'm retiring and this is why centrism sucks all right let's talk about this for a moment um so joe biden is going on the road to start to pitch certain uh provisions of the you know the build back better I understand why everything obviously had to be rolled into one. It's reconciliation, right? So everything becomes really just about the number and what's the number and everything works back from that. It seems to me this is a little bit late. I mean, he should have been doing this before, yeah. right? Like, I mean, this should have been the project for the summer. But the fact of the matter is the guy is old and he's tired. I don't know why. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. I, I mean, I'm coming up with a reason. Like, why wouldn't you go out there? Look at this clip of Chris Wallace talking with uh, John Barrasso. Uh, Barrasso is um, the the senator from Wyoming. Let's say, I mean, like the deep red. We're talking about deep red territory. Watch what happens when when Chris Wallace brings up, um, you know, one of the one of the bigger provisions, one of the the easier to uh, digest provisions of this bill. Let's talk about another part of the bill, which is universal pre-K. Uh, in the state of Wyoming, less than a quarter of children three to four, which is who would be covered in the bill, are enrolled in publicly funded preschool. Less than a quarter. Wouldn't a lot of Wyoming families benefit from universal pre-K? There are a number of things that will help the people of Wyoming. Overall, Joe Biden's policies have been hurting the people of Wyoming. And I believe that there should be things means tested. You just don't give things universally to everybody. I think there should be work requirements involved. The Democrats are trying to separate work requirements from just free <laughs> government checks and programs. Can we pause it you just a second? Congressman from the Progressive Caucus say, every Who does he want to work? The, the, the three year olds? Is that what he's doing? No, no. He wants no. to work for school. No, no. Here's what he wants. <laughs> He, he like <laughs> the if you want people to work give your the kids pre-k a uh, universal pre-k mm -hmm. like and also like you know th this oh, i mean i understand from his perspective he's signaling right like this is actually something for the, what's going to happen is the blacks are going to do it it's not going to be our you know people in wyoming they're going to teach crt yeah, they're going to the teach teach them yeah. crt but but he, he has to gloss right over the, the proposals. Yeah. But if Joe Biden had been hitting, now, I don't know, you'd go to Wyoming, that's probably not the first place you would go. But if Joe Biden was in Arizona talking about universal pre-K, 
Kamala Harris is in Arizona talking about universal pre-K. Joe Biden's in there talking about community call, whatever it is. Like, just going and hammering these policies there. So it's not just a question of Kristen Cinema is sort of like obscuring the reconciliation bill. Like, what the hell does that mean? But Kristen Cinema is preventing you from getting universal pre-K. I mean, Kristen Cinema is get, preventing you from getting free community college. Kristen Cinema is preventing your uh, mom or your dad from getting elder care. I mean, oh, that'd be huge there. Huge. Oh my God, huge in Arizona. And, and 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 the idea that this hasn't happened is complete political malpractice. It is Joe Biden either being literally, physically, just not up to the challenge of it which I you know, find hard to believe you couldn't send surrogates there. You have a vice president or just so overconfident in their ability to sort of play this inside game. And now all of a sudden in the ninth inning, they're down by six or seven runs and they're realizing like, oh, shoot, you know what? We, we should have been uh, we should have been playing, you know, these hitters to pull the whole time or something. I mean, the the. We'll, you know, get out there and promote the policies. Don't play prevent defense over your like entire political agenda. You have Can to use be other crazy. analogies, guys. Well, <laughs> what you're saying. Well, you know what the bottom line is. They should have yeah, 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 yeah. earlier yeah. in this in this, they in this need whole to be process. Aggressive and be playing like offensively and yeah. no understand. It's not like okay, cinema and mansion came out of the woodwork all of a sudden when Build Back Better was being proposed. And oh my God, these guys might be a problem. They may be present presenting us with issues with uh, their obstruction and their want desire to whittle things down. Um, if you had been going out there proactively, and again, if Trump, if there was one or two senators holding up Trump's entire agenda, uh, do you think that he would be going quietly and just like allowing the senatorial process to play out? No, he'd be going after them as the Republican president going after here. Republican senators. Um, and so uh, I, I think it has to a lot to do with Biden's kind of creature of Washington mentality and his uh, fetishization of the Senate senatorial like debate process as something that should be sacrosanct and not influenced in any way by outside forces, including himself at this point. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there was some sort of early on, like, you know, he's got an interesting White House, right? There are some definite progressives in the White House. And then there are some people who, you know, put themselves out as being progressive, but usually end up siding with the industry. And I'm, I'm curious if there was maybe early on two things going on. Um, they maybe thought, maybe some people in the White House thought that the, 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 the mod squad strategy and Kirsten's would actually win. Um, and maybe, or maybe they just thought that they were bluffing and that at the end they would fold. Um, I, because and, and, and all in the end, it being about keeping the Senate intact and not creating divisions as we go into midterms, you know, in, in a year, potentially like weakening some of these senators that they need. I'm just trying to think in the minds of a Washington operative about why you'd be so hesitant. And maybe it's just they didn't want to throw more flame, more, more whatever it is, on the fire. Um so that, you know, Democrats were fighting with each other going into the midterms. Listen, we're going to do poorly in the midterms. We're going to do poorly in the midterms. Would we have done poor if, if Biden was touring around? I don't know. I, I think he think that's this is the only way we keep whatever seats right now are on the edge. The idea um, that, that voters care about division within the Democratic Party to me is just like that's their mentality I, I get it right. no I know I think you're right in like getting into their mind and that's something that they're concerned about I don't no one gives a shit like no one gives a shit about like hypocrisy shaming McConnell on the debt ceiling no one gives a shit about like t the 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 infighting in the lead up to the passage of a bill when the midterms are a year yeah, away yeah they're not like, even aware no of one it. cares no one cares um, and, and I think, the, uh, well, we'll get to the debt ceiling miscalculation in a second. We got an IM, Mr. Groupie. Has the crew heard of David Shore? Yes, I have. I think everybody probably has here. Uh, he has some pretty compelling data suggesting that Democrats will struggle to win white working class defectors without returning to racial conservatism, suggesting that left populism won't bring them back to Democrats. I, I, I will say this. I am very suspect of the idea 
that um, left populism will help electorally. I don't think it's, it's you know, I don't think it's going to hurt, but I don't think it's going to. I just don't think it's it is a necessary but insufficient thing to do. Yeah, we saw Bernie attempt to left populism. He's the best person you could want to do it. And it wasn't enough. No. And I think I think but you do this because the way you shore up the people who voted for you to get into office is by actually delivering things. That's right. And when you come out to win an election, you're going to want those people, you want those people to show up first, <laughs> because if they don't show up, it doesn't matter how many, you know, you think the, you're, you're going to get collect from those who have defected from you. In fact, you won the last election. You don't need the people who defected from you. You need to get the people who voted for you and you need to get their kids who have now aged in and you need to get maybe, you know, maybe you need to bring some of the, the, the seniors who are all of a sudden like, what? I have dental now? Holy shit. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, so like that. Oh, it's called, I'm sorry, Sam. Is that called expanding your base? Yes, it is expanding oh, your base and, it, and, and you do that you do that by being consistent with your principles, but expanding on how many of those principles reach people. Yeah. And I don't think if there is a cohort of voters out there who have defected from the Democratic Party because they're racist or, you know, racially confused, whatever you want to call it, there's nothing that you have to offer those people that is consistent with where the party is at now. And so you have to say, the way that we counteract those, the loss of those votes, to the extent that there was a loss of those votes, is by expanding based upon the principles that we do have. And I still contend, you need negative partisanship. And so you, you, you try and, and put Republican uh, Congress people who are running for office or senators or on the state level, you nationalize everything because when you nationalize everything right now, it is, do you stand with Donald Trump and anti-vaxxing uh, vaxxers and anti-maskers and pro COVID people or not? That's where you put them in. You put them and, all in that question. And I really do think that there is something to be said. If you want to, if, if there is some sort of strategy, maybe it's not the leading strategy, but there is, a way to bring in some of those folks again, it's to take people like that senator from from Wyoming and 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 and, and others like him who are using talking points from the Heritage Foundation and just saying, you know, instead of talking about their failures during this pandemic and and you know your grandmother died because their lack of response because they are owned by industries. I do think that's a very effective message still to this day. If you want to bring in the populists, you talk about, you know, you have two options here. You got the guy who wants to expand, you know, to 3K and expand, you know, Medicaid and hopefully, you know, Medicare further. Or you got the people who are owned by the big industries. You don't have another option. This isn't Bernie's not in the race. And by the way, that's a primary, which is a completely different strategy. Here is... Um... Fox News's Sandra Smith and Martha McCollum. And again, like, you know, this is all signaling. This is all signaling to this is I mean, this is why uh, on some level, those defectors who need a racial conservatism, which, you know, <laughs> it's a nice way of saying they need a certain healthy dose of racism with their politics. Right. That and, and 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 David Shore may be right about that. That's the only way you're going to get those people back. Um, so don't get those people. So you don't get those people back. But this is the way it gets communicated to them. Like the the question is like, how does that racial conservatism, how does that factor into a fight about whether people should get universal pre-K or whether they should get elder care or whether they should have dental on their Medicare? How does it get factored in? through this sort of like proxy fight, which is this, this is clip number five. 
as she took those questions from Peter Ducey live, being given the opportunity to either double down on this is paid for, this is free messaging that the White House is putting out there, or to circle back and say, no, actually, it means that we'll either have to borrow or we'll have to raise taxes to pay for it. But we figured out a way to pay for it. But to continue with this message to the American voter that this is somehow free, free. or this is just somehow you're gonna paid get child for. Care, you're going to get education. You're going to get college education. You're going to get. 12 weeks time off from work, paid leave, and it's all free. It's not going to cost you a dime. And that is when the American people have to watch what's going on here and decide if we are a capitalistic society or we, we are one of socialism. Because that's really what is at stake here, responsibility versus entitlement. Well, that's it's where broken I think what, what you that. and Larry were talking about is so interesting. Because the, the idea of means testing, I've been saying, it's, it's not in style anymore. Mm -mm. I mean, that's out. Yeah. Because the, this is a much more socialist viewpoint, like what you see in the UK or you see in France, mm -hmm. where they don't want to designate for certain people who have need um, to say, you know, you have need and we want to be a safety net sure. for you. This is, we so don't want horrifying. anyone to have, there's no difference. Yeah. So everyone will get it. Even if you make $800,000 a year, you're going to get an $8,000 um, cut on your electric yeah. car. So means testing is gone. As Americans, we're compassionate people. We are going to help those that truly have needs and do need. It's those able-bodied... If you are making $800,000 a year and uh, you decide to send your kid to community college because it's free, um, I think that's good for society. Me too. Yes. I mean, it's like and if you're a billionaire and you send your kid to community college uh, for free, I think that's great for society. I think that's really good. You're going to uh, get uh, people at community college are going to have uh, access to um to resources and capital because their buddy all of a sudden is going to have a lot of cash and if they're going out to start a business or uh they need help or they're in a jam or something like that uh that's great that's, i mean that's, that's, that's the Finland way has people like a, yeah that's on. that's how people move through our society you know to the extent that there's any uh mobility um it is because they know people who have resources and uh, the best thing that could happen to society. In fact, it should be mandated. If you're a billionaire, you need to go to public school. In fact, like that, that's if you are wealthy, you have to go to public school. If you school. want your ta tax breaks, you actually have to go to public school. That's I, I, I am. I'm forced mandatory public board. school in favor. Means test their shit. Even if it's a retroactive, like 21 Jump Street situation, the billionaires have to go back to school. The, the means <laughs> testing thing, too, I think is like, I feel like that is losing its salience a little bit because really, at the end of the day, the Republicans aren't worried about wealthy people getting free benefits. They are worried about people who need the benefits yeah, getting the right. benefits. And that's why you're that's why it's getting like supplanted with these job requirements. Because the implication is there is like we're not gonna help the the loafers. Like the the means testing I think is just doesn't have the traction it does before because they're like, Well, wait a second, wait a second. The problem isn't the wealthy people. Wealthy people are okay. If they get a benefit, that's fine. Like, I mean, we'll get our mortgage interest deduction on our, our you know, our $800,000 house. That's fine. But um, it's the poor people who are getting stuff. Yeah. That's the problem. The means testing is supported because it stops people who should be uh, eligible from getting it, but they don't because of hurdles, not because yes. of what you're saying. Right. And, and there are better ways to do that. And a reminder to any Democrat that's consistently talking about, like, means testing. I mean, Manchin has been most public about it, but there are a lot of Democrats who think we should means test. About Hillary it. Clinton and, uh, said oh, that we should means test community college. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but Biden, too, has uh, a lot of means testing. In of his course. Deal as well look at what you're feeding into and look at the language that you're speaking and it's so stupid we have a mechanism to means test in this country we don't have to develop the, the wheel for every single program we have it's called taxes taxes exactly yeah you want to make sure that wealthy people are not getting more benefit out of government uh, relative to what they put into it raise their taxes we have a mechanism there it is literally like just changing a number you don't have to hire anybody new although you should probably hire a couple more irs agents but you don't really you don't have to build a new you don't have to create a new uh, system you don't have to have a new agency you don't have to do any of that you raise taxes period 
End of story. But why uh, why make things simple when you could just have a Rube Goldbar Goldberg machine of a variety of means testings in order to kind of just discipline well, the poor? Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, prevent people from actually accessing this stuff. And to also do what Andrew Cuomo does. Sorry? You know, you could do what Andrew Cuomo used to do, which is announce the great plan, put it on a website. Oh, by the way, the website doesn't work, so you can't actually take part in that plan. But the plan is great. Plan's great. It's there. Yeah, yeah. we got it there. You just can't sign up for it because your computer will crash. Um, <laughs> here we go. Let's go to uh, the Fox and Friends the other day. On one hand... We are told by the Republicans that the problem with immigrants and refugees in this country is that they're giving us COVID. <laughs> um, but then, on the other hand, I give you these guys. I will say this. I think it's pretty amazing for just Dr. Fauci to look at 1.5 million people who you know nothing about crossing into our country and says, not a problem. But if you see 100,000 college students uh, at a game, that's a problem. When most of these schools anyway are mandating these vaccines on top of that. It's, a, it's incredible it's a how political he is especially, on a daily basis. Especially when they say 20% of the migrants that are coming over right. the border are sick. Right, and they're that refusing we the of. vaccine that, we that we're going to give in for free. Right, and the, it, the number could be higher. We only know it's 20% because if you are showing symptoms, then they test you. If you, if you just have a fever and you're not showing symptoms, <laughs> you won't. And you can right have in. COVID and not show the symptoms. 100%. Do you think we should give the human traffickers uh, a mandate to vaccinate the people they're, they're trafficking across the border? You think that would help? We should start with more mandate mania. They'll make your oh kids get God. it, yeah. but not a lot the of traffickers. Cotton balls. Yeah. What? No, both. Both. I, I, I'm in favor of both. Yeah. I think we should be giving vaccines to everybody. And there are vaccine of a myriad of vaccine requirements for uh, migrants and immigrants to this country. Also, if you, if, if you ended this um, cruel prohibition, basically, uh, of crossing the border, you wouldn't have to put these people in the jeopardy of these people. And you could actually have just... Oh, you, you're crossing a border? Get the vaccine. Right. How about right. you don't I mean, stuff everybody in cages? You're worried about the coyotes. Uh, the way you deal with that is just say, like, yeah, line up, and we'll give you a vaccine, and uh, we will put you in our system, and see you later. And the microchip will help with tracking them, too. Oh, no. <laughs> you're not supposed to say that. Yeah, sorry. But that's... What the the whole point of vaccinating the migrants coming into the country is to create a Wi-Fi mesh. It covers that's the why country. they're all in the cage. It's like a contained unit. The Wi-Fi mesh. Horrifying. Yeah, Kilmeade, Kilmeade hasn't gotten the memo yet. Uh, it really is just... Um, I love the fact that they can sort of squeeze in both, like, can we get like both a vaccine mandate and a bash immigrant segment? Yeah. Like, we want to <laughs> stop them, but we also... We want to force them to have the vaccines. <laughs> but, yeah. but I also like what really got me about that was it, it, it would like it seemed like it even went too far for Fox and Friends, and it was so casual and like flipping, like like basically listening to some guys on their couch, you know, stare at a TV and make fun of immigrants. It, it, it seemed like it was even too far for Fox and Friends. I don't know. Maybe I've just well, watched too much of it. I don't know if we can find it right away, but there's a compilation I think Media Matters put up of Ainsley Earhart uh, mentioning her friends. And it's about two minutes saying, my friend did this, my friend did that, my friend, my friend, my friend owns this chicken salad restaurant. Oh, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> very funny, actually. I <laughs> find it. Uh, Left-handed strangers. I listened to Matt Bender's debate with Michael. I have a totally real girlfriend, Greenwald says so, Tracy. <laughs> it was good, but Michael Tracy is a slimy hoe and backpedaled at least three times and would raise his voice every time ben, uh, uh, Bender tried to interject something. Tracy just came off as insecure and ready to obfuscate on any topic at hand. I'm surprised he didn't gish gallop. This usually requires no something. He more often did the question everything tactic. It was pretty telling when he straight up admitted he didn't cho choose to consult medical experts for his COVID related articles because it didn't fit what his goal was. Overall, six for 10 uh, for those with nothing else to listen to. <laughs> um, I, he subsequently then did write an article where he sort of cited some doctor who wrote a thing and i read the piece actually and it was one of the most garbage pieces i've ever seen it's like there's no evidence uh that uh that that masks uh work 
And then he just went on to cite a bunch of other things without providing any evidence for those assertions. Uh, it was really sort of stunning. But they're just uh, jokers. I mean, real, real. I asked somebody to uh, um, send me, because I, I said if some of that crew has done good journalism, but like, can you send me a good piece of journalism Michael Tracy's done? <laughs> and they sent me a Matt Taibbi article. <laughs> 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 Ban Don Gino. As we get closer to the debt ceiling and catastrophic default on treasury bonds, I want to shout out the simplest solution, minting a trillion dollar coin. Ron Gray is the best source with a legal review of the coin's constitutionality and practicality. I cannot tell you how many times I have done a segment on the, uh, on the coin over the past 10 years. Yeah, I mean, and apparently Axios coming out with, uh, with a, an article saying that it could take literally minutes. So. Yeah. Prairie Over Fire done with and I'll oh, be yeah cool, exactly. I know just Prairie Fire the Kowalski well the, the there's this weird thing that I think there is this real reluctance to concede to the American public and to ourselves that like wait a second this whole thing is fake is is we have this we have constructed this fake um, notion of scarcity of money that we have that it that there is some outside force that prevents us from simply dismissing our debt to ourselves and i think there's a fear of the the ruling elite to concede that because yeah. if they concede that what does mansion talk about what does Joe Lieberman talk about? What does No Labels talk about? What does anybody who, anybody who ever says the word fiscal responsibility, what do they talk about as to why you can't have Medicare for all or universal pre, I mean, what, when, what happens is if you take out that force of, you know, that they consider as nature, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Physics, whatever it is. Yeah. You take that out, all of a sudden it just reveals, oh, we're just making decisions as to who the winners and losers are in our society. That's it. We can't blame fiscal responsibility or anything. We're just deciding that these people get stuff. They get the mortgage interest deduction, whatever they get, the, whatever whatever it is. They get the highways and the, and the, the roadways and they get subsidized airline travel and they get subsidized energy that they're going to use a lot more than other people and they're going to do well and we're just deciding as a society it, it, political economy it, baby exactly there was an economist on um for cuny and I, I i forgot her name i apologize but she was on npr today and on wnyc and it was amazing because she just said she just said you know what people don't understand about the debt ceiling and how it's, and she said it was an it's an it's an illusion. Stephanie it's, Kelton. No, it wasn't Stephanie Kelton. I knew who Stephanie Kelton was. No, it was somebody outside of the 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 mainstream, normal, you know, progressive universe. Um, and she said she's like, but it's tied to how strong and reliable and stable a government is, and so everything related to the debt she's breaking it down that way, is dependent on the U.S. government being the most reliable, stable government in the world. And that's why we can get away with, you know, endless debt, whatever. It's all, it's obviously, these are borders, just like actual physical borders, you know, make a state strong. And, you know, in traditional political science, that's what you're taught. I don't agree with it. I'm just saying that's sort of what you're, you're taught. It's the same thing with the economy. Is like they have to have these confines, they have to have these borders, they have to have these ideas. But at the end of the day, as long as the U.S. government is seen as the most reliable, stable government in the world, there's never going to be a debt crisis, is what she said. Never. It's an interesting way of looking at it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't even. I, I mean, frankly, I don't even accept uh, that. Like, I think that that is reliant too much on this notion of. I mean, I think yes, you know. It, our position of being the the world's currency is key to this and uh, in, in terms of giving us the flexibility but um there's not going to be a debt crisis because we owe most of the money to ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have the ability to pay ourselves back literally in in seconds of course is, in, in in you know as long as it it, it it takes about as long as it takes me 
well, maybe even less to, you know, try and open up my QuickBooks and uh, just change the ledger. But, but more than anything, it's it doesn't appeal to voters. This is the thing that I never understood. I feel like it's just a beltway excuse because they need an excuse when nothing else works. But let me tell you, if you polled Wyoming voters, I'm going to guess Wyoming voters or West Virginia voters in the case of Joe Manchin are not thinking about the debt ceiling at all, don't understand it at all. So no, I think, think all I think the, those voters, all they get, all they understand is and I'm not denigrating. I'm also not not denigrating uh, the voters. Uh, people, I think, know that I'm happy to denigrate the voters. But there is a um, there is just sort of like the 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 ripples hit, like you know, like uh, rock drops in the middle of the pond. It's not felt by by most people in the country. It's just felt as like a little bit of a little wave as it hits the shore. They don't. They, 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 those two things don't don't even line up the 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 pebble the the rock in the pond and so they just hear like disarray who's the president joe biden joe biden's got us in disarray there's not this is not going to work out in the way that chuck schumer thinks it's going to work out just put it into reconciliation do your dumb uh, voterama thing and get it done apparently the parliamentarian says you can't get rid of the debt ceiling you know uh, forever on that or just Stop being idiots and mint the coin and get this over yeah. with and finish it. Once you do it once, it's over. Nobody gives a shit. There's none of those people are going to give a shit. They're like, wait a second, Joe Biden, he's the one who minted the coin. I didn't do it. I'm not voting for that guy. Nobody's ever, you know, there's not a single human being who's going to say that. And part of it is just like, I mean, the, I, I think a lot of, there are a lot of fictions that uphold this kind of thinking, but there's nothing more pervasive than their own sense of self-importance in the Senate in particular, because they have to, they, they feel that they are a part of something immensely, you know, esteemed and important. And so every gradation and every decision we make must resonate in the same way that it does with us because we are the United States Senate with the rest of the, of the public. And it just fundamentally misunderstands what politics is um, and also just only serves themselves, which is one of the, my biggest pet peeves about it. <laughs> uh, Puffinbird420, ask any IT professional. The Facebook network outage was almost unquestionably due to them scrubbing their servers in an algorithm in a response to the whistleblower. Wow. I like that. I mean, I feel like until uh, another explanation comes forward, that's the one to uh, emphasize. I, 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 I got to feel there was some, that is quite, I mean, when was the last time Facebook went out for six hours? That's 2008, I think, I think they said. Or yeah, eight, I don't remember it. Or yeah. even an hour. Uh, Laura, what's the point of the EU anti-tax avoidance legislation if countries like Cyprus and Monaco can still be used for offshore banking? Call me cynical, but I don't see anything changing with the Pandora Papers. Sonarchy, I gave my brother a gift MR subscription in August 2020. I think he turned in a f tuned in a few times, but never really got in any deeper because a, a genetic heart condition killed him a year ago today. Oh. Rest in peace, Pat. A show far would be fitting tribute. Uh... This is for Sonarchy and Pat. Rest in peace, bud. <laughs> Hang in there, man. Uh, really sorry about I'm that. I'm so sorry. Militant Apathy. Have you checked out the show Why? The Last Man. Very interesting plot. I have not, but I but I will. Uh Fierce deity, cinema's obstinance on this bill is really a double whammy as far as their constituency goes. Not only with all the undocumented people in her state who would benefit from path citizenship, but the large number of retirees would greatly benefit from Medicare expansion. Mm -hmm. Aaron needs to be careful in the streets of Worcester, that's for sure. What's our medical system really needed was to work in Major League Baseball's salary arbitration system. <laughs> Happy Camper, did you see Dave Rubin's debate with Gloria Allred on the vaccine mandates? I can see why he's afraid of debating Sam. It would be career suicide. Actually, uh, let's play a clip from this. Mm. Now, this guy, this the, Dave Rubin gets hit with a question that is such the obvious question, yet he can't even come up with his own answer. He gives the same answer that apparently 
Tucker Carlson gives when he is asked this same question by a reporter. It's stupid and juvenile, the response, but God, man, come up with your own frickin' material. Aren't you embarrassed? It's not like Tucker Carlson is some type of, like, backwoods, well, who paid? It's not like anybody knows yeah. Tucker Carlson. I found it on, like, some random YouTube channel. Here he is. Here's uh, Dave Rubin with Gloria Allred. Yes, children could transmit the disease, although they rarely do, but the parents are all vaccinated if they're good, decent citizens. So I, I don't really understand the connection, actually. Are you a good, decent citizen? Are you vaccinated? It's nobody's business whether I'm uh -huh. vaccinated. That's like me okay. asking you the last time you got laid. I mean, it's just irrelevant. All right, so, you know, what's really relevant is that it's one thing if I, you have the right my, my to medical, choose for My your, medical wait, history may I just, is not I, your I, business, I, nor yours is mine. Let, let Clary finish. You know what? The time, the last time that I got laid, or Gloria Allred got laid, in no way implicates the health of the people in this office. I mean, my attitude might be a little bit better That's or worse. I don't know. But, <laughs> but there is no chance based upon the time in which I got laid. Is getting laid contagious? Yeah. That, that you guys are going to <laughs> sick or maybe get your parents sick. Right. But here's Tucker Carlson, Ben Smith. Last month, I texted, I texted Tucker Carlson to ask him a question that was on my mind. Did you get vaccinated? When was the last time you had sex with your wife? And in what position? He replied, we can trade intimate details. I mean, does Dave Rubin, like, like come on. No, come no, 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 no. You, you're not getting it, Sam. Don't you know? Just like Fox News and, like, you know, all these other websites get their talking points from the day from, you know, the Heritage Foundation or wherever. Same thing. You've got this little, like, little, little world that gets their talking points. When you're asked this, say this, and then everybody else is going to repeat the same thing. That is the key to messaging. Repeat, yeah, repeat, just repeat. So two bit. Like he, there are a lot of pundits, by the way, who are trying to copy Tucker Carlson. Charlie Kirk also regularly steals from Tucker Carlson. They all just want to be him. Um, but I mean, Dave does it the most and artfully, and that's what makes him our favorite, of course. Curious, we, what was? How did this happen? Like, how did Gloria Allred and Dave oh, no, Rubin? It was like a Fox, uh, uh, you debate. know, Channel 11 LA. It's a local TV oh, debate segment. And asking, uh, how old is Gloria Allred? I mean, like, in terms of just... <laughs> we're asking Gloria Allred. He's asking Gloria Allred when the last time she got <laughs> laid was. Like, how does he think that's going to play for the Fox local TV audience? <laughs> local TV audience. <laughs> I mean, this this old lady with like the morning show. Eighty years old, Bradley says. That's not. That's not. I mean, eighty year olds. Yeah, you can get after it. Yeah, you can get after it, but it, I would say that it's a bit distasteful. Well, local I, TV. I mean, I think I'm sure Gloria Allred has had more distasteful things said to her. But the point is, is that it's not at all the same. When he says, like, what difference does it make to you? If you're sitting next to me, it makes a huge difference. You know who it does make a difference to is uh, Dave Rubin's audience. Because if Dave says, yes, I'm actually vaccinated, a whole bunch of people that uh, listen to Dave Rubin are going to be upset because he uh, swallowed the big lies about the vaccine. And, and, and it also probably makes a difference to healthcare workers in your uh, city because um, the higher the percentage of vaccine, unvaccinated people the more likely they are working uh, overtime or dealing with, uh, you know, more death. Um, so it makes a huge difference to society. In fact, that's the whole freaking point. Okay, I have a, a, an initiative. In any state or city where you have a vaccination requirement to enter a building or a restaurant, for instance, New York, if anybody has dined with Dave, Ru Dave Rubin in a New York City restaurant, that will ultimately prove that he has been vaccinated or any of these other folks. Tucker, Car I bet you Tucker Carlson has eaten inside of a restaurant in New York City. Of yes. course he's been vaccinated. And he's been in the Fox News building and he traveled to Hungary for that conference. I don't know if Hungary specifically has that vax requirement or like it's just I mean, the international travel to Europe. I mean, you have to be vaccinated from the United States. So, well, you know, it's catch him on camera. He's such an idiot, though. Like, I, I, like, I understand he's got to go on and, and try and avoid answering that question for the reason Matt says. 
But dude, honestly. Yeah, and my You've point, had months to come up with something, you know, other than just repeat what Tucker said. And my point about that too is just like that's on local TV and it's just comes off as crude and is not going to play with say if he, the same audience as if he was a guest on Tucker Carlson's yeah. program. Yeah, I think it's weird that he did it. Like Yes. I honestly like take the night off, Dave. Why are you doing that debate? But I don't know. I think he probably thought he was going to attack feminist, you know, lawyer Gloria Allred and use it as content. Yeah, 100%. Right. And uh, in true fashion, he chose to sprinkle a bit of misogyny in there with that comment. And that's how it's going to come off. It's just, it's, it's like, you, they really, they're, he's so stupid and bad at the tactics that he has no ability to kind of gauge who he's speaking to in any persuasive way. But here's, here is the thing that we should also keep in mind. People who are anti-vax, you know, anti-masking, anti-even COVID testing. Anti-the all, authoritarianism of they all They just, it. all they want to do is be able to live in peace and not be harassed by other people, okay? They just want to live their lives. Yes, we may quibble about the fact that they're infecting other people and that they can't really live their own lives. But at the end of the day, all they want is to be free from some type of oppression. And, and we, we, we are so smug and aggressive about it. It's disgusting. Let's just look uh, at this clip number 11. The, later in, do, do they? Sorry, that was it. Um, I they just flip over the 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 tent and not like the car, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's like I Will Maneker pointed this out on Twitter. Um, they are supposed to, if they're anti-vax, at least be in favor of testing because that's what they say, right? Then you're able to continue and live on with your life. That's the way out. Right. But the reality is, is that say they don't want to get vaccinated. Okay, well, the next step is uh, let's at least do some mitigation measures, masks. Oh, no, we don't want that either. Oh, okay. But then at least should we test people to make sure that they don't infect others? No, they don't want that either. The, the thing is, is this is just like... Plandemic. Yeah. This is plandemic. It's just like... It's, they want to like, pretend it's not real. They don't want to exist in reality. And, 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 the and that's hiding, it. The hiding behind whatever NBA player, this or that, like it's all just to emphasize this point to this audience. Like right. they'll, they'll hide yeah, behind yeah. like the... Like look at how uh, well-reasoned and amazingly articulate this uh, basketball player was. But it's really like this is the real sentiment that they're uh, appealing Pretty to. Pretty sure that was the title of a Jimmy Dore video, right? Yeah, that's it's all anti-vax content now. Wait, wait, hang on. So this was just for folks who, I don't know if we led with this. This is in the middle of Union Square in New York City, in like Manhattan. Yeah. I mean, and that is... Like, were those The same protesters, but there was a George Floyd... Uh, yeah. There defaced. was a George Floyd statue that was up, went up two days ago that's already been defaced. So like, is there any sense of, uh, did the cops do anything? Uh, did they arrest these? Were they from New York City? Um, were they from Long Island? I'm very curious who these folks were. I'm not saying anti-vaxxers don't exist in New York. I see people without masks on in buildings without the vax card all day long, including my lobby. Um, but I'm just curious, like, what happened? Did the, did the cops do their job? Did they arrest folks for endangering others and flipping 
over a tent that could have hit. There's a little old woman who was walking through. What have happened if she hurt her head? I mean, there was a kid that almost got hit with that yeah. tent, but um, uh, and uh, now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh yeah, there was another uh, uh, video. We don't have it, but of uh, protesters going up and just shaking hands with the cops that were protecting courthouses and stuff like that. So like, <laughs> sympathy. Yeah. I thought this was all about protecting property. So does this property not matter as opposed to the Best Buy across the street? Yeah, I guess not. And uh, neither does apparently the George Floyd. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Again, we don't know uh, if this was the same protesters, but oh wait, it seems like it was a spray painter now I'm remembering, but at the same time, like doubt, doubt the police would be pursuing that one. Uh, on that note, have we touched on how the police union headquarters has been raided? Not yet. Talked about? No, we haven't talked about it. I mean, there's really not much more information other than the police union headquarters has been raided by the FBI. They also raided Ed uh, Mullins' house, who is the head of that union. It's one of the top uh, leadership unions in uh, in the NYPD. And he is the guy who uh, doxed uh, Bill de Blasio's daughter, who mm -hmm. was arrested in the uh, Black Lives Matter protesters last, uh, protest last summer. Yeah. I, I'm, I couldn't be happier. I'm live. I know. This is cop, amazing. Cop, cop, uh, crime. <laughs> Dank Uger, at least Joe Manchin will lie to you from the back of his yacht. <laughs> Alphas are better than gammas and epsilons. Um, Kristen Cinema's high IQ, high self-esteem, and low empathy quotient suggest Disney is missing one of their experimental self-driving animatronics. <laughs> Fluffington, fluffing the aggrievement pillow. Uh, if the COVID molecule is a beach ball, how big is a fart molecule again? Alpha's talk. Cinema's office and allies are labeling these confrontations with activists as harassment and hostile to prevent others from doing the same. Sol Hosenberger. Emma is searching for blackmail on you at the office. Wow, are you guys really changing the format? Oh, I'm not sure I get it. I don't get it. Jonathan Armstead, that video of Marjorie Taylor Greene yelling into AOC's letterbox slot makes her seem like a Karen demanding to speak to the manager of the glory hole. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, boy. Uh, kid, uh, kid tested Paul Bureau approve. I uh, wish you guys could listen to the conservative radio station in Cincinnati. The noon show had a sheriff on that confused Fiddler on the Roof and Nero, a.k.a. Biden. <laughs> Rome burned. What? They said uh, Biden's the fiddler on the roof. I'm not quite sure I get it, but I don't get uh, it's part. always snowy in Ottawa. Listening at work, I'm a bit behind on the show. Isn't the whole fear tactic about why the USA can't have a Canada like single payer system because of the long wait times? Eight hours waiting for an EKG at the GER doesn't sound like an efficient free market system to me. Isn't competition supposed to kick in by hour four, maybe six? Yeah, no kidding. I had to go up to him. I go like, hey, I'm leaving. Like, like if I, you know, if I was going to die, I would have died by now. I got to get to work. And they were like, oh, wait a second. We got $500 to charge here. So let's just hook him up to an EKG hmm. and get out of here. Mm -hmm. Um Black trigonometry, about to pull an Emma and shatter my phone into a million little pieces if the Red Sox lose tonight. Yep, still still broken. Oliver Wendell, home slice. Love the show, but you guys are the New York Giants of making analogies. <laughs> Quinn from the Cyclone Barkley. Quinn from Indianapolis. I'd like to imagine there's one Ernest Peacock viewer of the show that is always wa uh, confused while watching. I'd like to imagine there's one Ernest Peacock viewer. That would be nice. Yeah, right in. Uh, what does <laughs> sun's out, guns out mean? Why does this man berate his guest and threaten fighting him in the street? <laughs> does he actually believe Ronald Reagan is calling it to a show and sending him apples? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Super League hater. The cinema pearl clutching is so bad it has Ben Shapiro bitching about the intolerant left at her defense on Twitter. Yeah, I know. It's all the same. Alcoholic Sam, are you ready for Bucky Dent 2.0 tonight? Yeah, good thing you didn't, uh, you just came up with a fake name for that. Uh, Gas 9 Sam took a black calculus in college. It was brutal, but I credit it with turning me into a leftist today. <laughs> Uh, Big Abe owner. Saturday Night Live is stealing your material. <laughs> what is that? Big Abe owner. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. 
<laughs> SNL is stealing your material. On the last cold open, the Biden character called Joe Manchin the effective president of the United States. Please send me a 10% finder's fee after you get off your, get your out-of-court settlement. The Biden character was played by uh, James, James Austin Johnson. Whoa. He was all over the season premiere of SNL. I, I caught a little bit of it yesterday. It might be the first SNL I watch in a long time. Now. Yeah. Wow, and, uh, I may have to go back in and watch that. They have one good sketch, the, uh, the, the black girl who was missing that they did on the weekend update. That was pretty good. But like he was uh, good for a friend of the show, sort of. <laughs> That's good. Um, between the 101 and the 5, establishment Dems will be district redistricting against progressive left, though. For example, L.A. City's council redistricting shuts out the most left candidate, Nitha Rahman, from a large part of uh, most progressive constituency in Koreatown because of the new maps. Tension-seeking narcissists, all of them, in a bubble of grandiosity. Their bubbles created by those who they are as much as their positions. Well, I don't know about the second part, but the first part... Yes, I think you're right. In 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 the main, you're going to have more conservative uh, politicians get rid of people who they disagree with. I mean, that's in office. I mean, that is that is always a problem. Uh, Mao Mao Cinema, more like Peter Dookie. <laughs> people are entitled because they want the government to do its job, but rich people believe we should collectivize losses and individualize gains, aren't? Um. In your endo, uh, Bucky Dent couldn't think of something sooner when talking to an Aaron, maybe an Aaron that was a major boon to a World <laughs> Series birth. Well, Bucky Dent, this is the, I don't know if there's been a time where you had a one game playoff like this since 78 between the Red Sox and the, and, yeah. and the Yankees. And maybe there, I don't think there has been. Right. That was a series. This is a one, one game and it's a play in. Kim from Harville on Facebook outage yesterday. Sam will be ha Sam will be happy to hear it was caused by some automated changes Facebook made to its routing tables. In layman's terms, they pulled the signposts that point Facebook down and didn't replace like they should have. Uh, an employee leaked details on Reddit before Panic deleted his account. Hmm. I would like to see more evidence of that. Sam, I know you're a mass hole and understand rooting for the home team and all, but you must see that the Red Sox are evil. Maybe not Yankees level evil, but still evil. Go Mets. I really don't know anything about sports ball. I'm just craving attention. <laughs> that sounded like a sports fan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, both the Yankees and Red Sox are evil. That is true. Oof. Bad tick. Governor HVAC, regulatory capture will just lead to this new middleman choosing the higher rate at every time. Freudian slip from Sam. I think he knows exactly when he, I am Gloria Allred, got laid. Ew. Stop the meal. Was this the plan of middleman arbitration set up by Walter Block? Brainwave. It's easy to understand. Those new health arbiters are in the private sector, which means they're helping the economy. If they were government positions, it would be wasteful. MD lawyer. Sam, I work in personal injury law. You usually have four bills for an ER visit. The ambulance. I didn't take one. The facility. Yes. The doctor. Yes. And the radiology. I didn't have radiology. Usually when people check into the hospital, the facility takes your insurance, but doesn't communicate it to the other billers. Most billers are third-party billing companies as well, not the hospital itself, which makes it even harder to get them. We've had clients complete months of physical therapy, and by the time we get the uh, physical therapy bills and records, we're still waiting on bills connected to the ER visit. The system is totally screwed. It, it, it's nuts. And, and apparently they didn't share the information, so they just, all of a sudden I get something from the collection agency because they're the only one who has my records or whatever it was. Yeah. It's me. Idiot uh, with everyone. Sam, you just fucking aced the pronunciation of her name perfectly. It was all in the rhythm. Just chef's kiss. Emma, this Thursday, can you do clips from the Sage Steel J. Cutler interview? Oh, God. Uh, maybe. I don't even know what the hell that means. Sounds like a car crash. I, I believe, and I think we're... Did, you, did it say Sage? I have no idea. Um, the an ESPN uh, anchor spoke on Jay Cutler's podcast. Jay Cutler's like a 
conservative anti-vax uh, vaxer. Oh Jesus! Sage Steele is a little bit uh, conservative as well. Uh, yeah, and she made some some comments uh, that we can get into for sure. We should talk about this too because this is a big deal. Um, where do I have this? Oh, she come, came out as a Candace Owens fan, apparently. She came on as that? She came out as one. She complimented she Candace Owens. Well, oh, I don't well. the Yahoo News. Yeah, her and, uh, her and Carrie Underwood now in the same boat. I can't seem to find the, the article in front of me right now, but um, Hald Coe. He is an advisor in the State Department. Yeah. And uh, this is a guy who had been... Um, he was in the Obama administration. He Clinton administration too. In the Clinton administration. Um, He's a senior or was a senior advisor and the sole political appointee on the State Department's legal team. Yeah, and and he I think was at the uh, the DOJ when they did the targeted assassination program. Drones. Um, the um, he. Let me just get pull this up here. He was the State Department legal advisor uh, from 2009 to 2013. Okay. When they decided not to go after uh, the torturers in the Bush administration, this guy didn't quit. He didn't quit during, um, you know, uh, the targeted killing that they uh, developed under the Obama administration. However, he has announced that he is leaving his role in the Biden administration uh, sending a, an internal memo criticizing the president's youth use of Title 42, started by Donald Trump during the pandemic. It is ostensibly uh, a ruling issued by the CDC that it is too dangerous to allow immigrants into this country. And it denies them their statutory right it's not just their statutory right. It's, it's the statutory obligation of the U.S. government to provide them a process in which their claim for refugee status or temporary protected status, for that matter, is adjudicated. So these people, we've seen it most recently with uh, Haitian immigrants. Their country has been devastated by disasters the wake of two, uh, like a, an earthquake and a hurricane, and then the disaster of a, a political assassination where their president was, was, was killed, assassinated, on top of which they're one of the poorest countries, well, certainly in the Western Hemisphere. And, you know, we've gone into the history of the United States making sure that that was the case. But nevertheless... Title 42 doesn't even allow for deportation. It's just immediate expulsion. And um, Co. said that the Title 42 was illegal, that it was inhumane, and it was not worthy of this administration that I so strongly support. Quote, I believe this administration's current implication, uh, implementation of the Title 42 authority continues to violate our legal obligation not to expel or return Individuals who fear persecution, death, or torture, especially migrants fleeing from Haiti. He added that lawful, more humane alternatives plainly exist. Um, this is a big deal. This is the second person yeah. to resign from the Biden administration over what we're doing specifically with Haitian immigrants. This year, the Biden administration has had has set a record for the number of refugees that have been admitted into this country. It is not a record high number. It is a record low number of refugees. And let's be clear, this is not just a Democratic problem. You had the uh, Republicans in the Senate the other day try and um, pass an amendment that wanted to curtail assistance to Afghan refugees uh, in this country. I mean, I the, the Biden administration's calculation on this is that they don't get any political benefit from helping uh, Haitian 
immigrants or refugees or immigrants, broadly speaking, they're they don't get a political benefit. They're very scared of the ABC border panel, for example. And they're so afraid. Uh, and it is, again, completely myopic. You, you're you not vying for the votes of people who are going to be pissed about the number of Haitian immigrants that you let into this country. You're not vying for them. And the media that they consume is already saying that you're in favor of open yeah. You have an open of course. Policy. So it doesn't, it literally matters zilch what you do substantively. They'll say the same thing. I mean, they, they, they weren't scared of withdrawing from Afghanistan. He was willing to take a week of bad news for that one and take that hit. So why is this? I don't think it's about media anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm the, the, the type of um, confusion I'm having towards the Biden administration and their border policy, which I'll come up, I'll give you some examples of what they could at least do, even if it, if, if it's just a signal it's it's such a confusion that it's like looking at Kirsten Cinema and being like, what is in her mind? I don't understand what they're thinking because it's only hurting. I mean, it, it's hurting their administration clearly when you have people leaving after decades of, of of work there on pretty neoliberal immigration policies. But the least they could do is come up with a plan. They could do. They could. I'm going to go back to Andrew Cuomo. They could pull on Andrew Cuomo. I've created a commission to invest. That's what a smart neoliberal liberal politician would do to at least address that there's a crisis there and that they're dealing with it, even if they're overwhelmed, don't know how to handle it, whatever. It's not what I would do. Make that clear. But it's what you would expect a neoliberal to do to at least differentiate themselves from. Trump's policies and say, we're dealing with a crisis that he created. It's going to take some time. It's not easy. We're in the middle of a pandemic, but this is what we're planning on doing. And we're going to investigate, but it's not happening. It's, you know, Kamala Harris. Well, let's remind everybody just a few months ago, went to Guatemala, appeared on stage with an pretty much a dictator, the Trump of Guatemala, Guatemala on stage, buddy, buddy with him saying, stay here. Like, 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 they have the, this is, this is not empathy. This is not, this is, this, this, it's, 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 it's poor politics. I don't understand what their agenda is, what their strategy, the least they could do is send smoke signals that they're actually working on it and they're in over their heads. That's the least they could do. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's a human, I mean, but, but going back to co inhumane, I mean, it's inhumane. It's against uh, international law. Let's be clear. Status uh, program specifically, specifically for Haitian for, well, not just, but, but specifically that would apply to these Haitian immigrants. I mean, I don't know what more of a scenario you need to have than the poorest country in this hemisphere yeah. suffering over the course of three months. A, a devastating earthquake, a devastating hurricane, and the political assassination of your president by probably, which implicates probably other members of your government. I mean, I, I just don't, you know. Let alone our own role. In I'm just talking about the past three months. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we're, I'm, I'm, I'd imagine, setting up uh, some intelligence infrastructure in order to influence who leads the country next thing will be I'm not convinced that, that we well. weren't involved in oh, every aspect, yeah, everything else that happened um it's it's gross it's gross evan flow i've never had a surprise bill but i did have a kidney stone that cost a combined 1500 dollars uh, for a couple of hospital visits it was big enough to recommend surgery but i was getting the first couple of bills i tried passing it on my own thank god it seemed to shrink enough to pass after a few weeks but guess Ooh, where my, my first stimulus check went oh jeez <laughs> Third lemon, lemon. I had two kidney stones in high school. You did. Yeah. Oh my God. They had no idea. No. Uh, I know it was very rare, and like they tested it, and yeah. But um, I can sympathize. But now, if I ever, if I have kids, so I'll, I'll kind of have a bit of a preview of what it was like. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, oh, it's good. pretty pretty painful. That's what they say it's like. So. Josh from Tucson. Just wanted to report that my bike shop is almost full of bikes again. Yesterday I was at the shop and they received a huge shipment from Ibis Bicycles. If you're looking for a bike, check out Copper Spoke Cycles in Tucson. Ooh, my opinion, that out when just wants to make a crap load of money and get out at this point. I just don't know how she's going to make a crap load of money, though. That's the thing. It's like, There's a lot of ways for her to make money. Senators, even if they never utter a word on the floor of the Senate, can leave the Senate and make a crap load of money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sam's hanging chat. Sam, if you go to hell and your punishment for all eternity was to spend it with either Meghan McCain or Anna Navarro, 
and listen to their commentary, who would you pick? Going back to purgatory is not an option, and heaven is obviously out of the question, and you have to be a Republican to get in there. Why does it have to be women? Anna Navarro. Because it, maybe it's just because they're both, uh, the, that's Navarro's her view replacement. I would probably go with Anna Navarro. Yeah. I don't know. There's few people that, like, make me want to Megan McCain makes me scream, really annoyed. Scream, yeah. Uh, real ace attorney first week that I've been happy about the Giants in a while feels good man it does it feels really good Arian uh, ran d uh, dominatrix how much jabber could an Anne okay I don't know where that's going but it doesn't look good uh, app app uh, does Emma really think spring is the best time to plant trees lol yeah, yes Roasted. I yeah, I'm not. I'm a <laughs> bear at home uh, too. Sam, can you clarify your apple take? My understanding is Washington apples are for show, like the red delicious, and New York uh, uh, state apples are for consuming, like every New York state apple variety are edible. Was it a houseboat or a yacht? Uh, maybe a houseboat. I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you. In the main, I look at Washington apples, and they're really just like. Uh, you know, they're just for like, you know, showrooms and stuff like that. You don't really, there's no substance to them, you know. Those are plastic uh, apples, Sam. <laughs> just, well, more or less. I mean, uh, you know, in N New England and in New York State, you, you have heritage apples. You have apples that have been, you know, around for, for literally for, for centuries. And they're hardy. They will they will winter, and uh, you know keep you in uh, vitamins and fiber for you know well into February, March. So, but great talk. I'll say it's a good apple. That's it. This Sam reminds me of that NPR skit. <laughs> Sam's butt joint. Um, there's not an insignificant group of apolitical women who fancy themselves the wacky girl in the office because they have a streak for blue hair where nothing uh, but polka dots who will be buying her books and various other media projects for years after this. Sorry for the typos. I'm working out. Uh, Walrus. Speaking of Virginia, did you see the anti-Semitic flyer ad their GOP made about Democratic delegate Dan Helmer? I didn't, but... JP from Philly, cinema classic narcissist. She shined up version of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Nature girl, I'm betting cinema isn't going to run for re-election. She's found enough money from Big Pharma, and that's the only thing that makes sense to me. I mean, uh, that's strange. The Tim Caucus, no Mickey. Enjoyed your spot on Rising earlier. Really been uh, loving it with Ryan Grimm. Sam, had the billing thing happen to me with in urgent care? Thankfully, they were both in network, but it was still a double copay. Taxation accomplished means testing without the bureaucracy, and I'm tired of conservatives pretending they aren't just trying to put up hurdles. That's right. Cinema Toast, new member, glad to be here. Well, glad to have you. Cinema Toast. <laughs> Sam Schmieder, based on what we're seeing, it looks like cinema's not crazy. She's a narcissist. She wouldn't be a household name if she went along with the program, and it seems like that's what she wants. Her picture taken and profiles about her in weekend plans. She doesn't care about re-election. All right. Three more. Militant agnostic. Ooh, that's too long. My wife and I recently moved to Sweden in large part due to our exposure to this show a few years back. We drove you out of the country a few months ago. We did have a guy back when we were in the old place. I'm pretty sure he was either... I'm pretty sure he was Swedish, but maybe he was Danish. And he came in to visit the show. He'd come from, uh, from he'd been traveling in Europe. Uh, Michael and Matt and I, old Matt, were in literally like a, a quarter of this space, not even. And he's sitting there and we, we were talking about the working poor. And he's like, what is that? I'm like, well, people who are living below the poverty line, but they're working. And he goes, and, and we asked him like, what is, what is, how do you say that in, in Swedish? And he's like, we don't, we don't, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. We don't have a word for it. We don't like that concept. How does that happen? And 
it was like I remember saying to him, it's like I said, like it, 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 talking to you is like talking to like a floating orb. Yeah, <laughs> come from the future or some other you know, really distant place. Um, anyways, a few months after my wife re-registered as a Swedish citizen, she was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. She had a lumpectomy and starts her second round of chemo next Tuesday. Prognosis is good. My wife has done well so far. I'm glad to hear that. She also had an amazing experience with the Swedish medical system. She's seen multiple doctors so far, and her oncologists and surgeons are on a tumor board, which has conferred on every decision since her initial diagnosis. According to two friends in the States, a doctor and a cancer ward nurse, this kind of early conference and coordination between doctors is not even available on some Cadillac plans in the U.S. Too hard for the insurance companies to coordinate this kind of information exchange, apparently, anyway. The total cost of everything so far, including all medications, has been U.S. forty dollars wow we will see if there's any surprise billing lol you guys at mr indirectly saved my wife and i from financial ruin at the very least oh possibly more we're forever indirectly in your debt in the states even with a decent insurance plan my wife and i put off going to the doctor all the time who knows if she would have waited when she felt that lump living in america love what you guys do thanks for everything that's right wow. that's really amazing thanks so much very, for writing in can I just do like a little follow up just because it was today on that? Yeah. Um, and it was benign, so don't stress out. But last year I, I had a lumpectomy also. Uh, I was having chest pain on one side of my my chest and I didn't know where it was coming from. And I went to all these different it was it was very expensive, I'll just say. I went to the ER twice. They said I was like, it was in my head, literally. <laughs> they they did the thing that they are not supposed to do with women. Um, and finally, I had a female doctor who said, you know, you might be, you might have a blockage here. There might be like a cyst or a tumor um, causing pain somehow on the other side. So I went and of course it was a benign tumor and I got it taken out. So now I have to go in. They keep call they're harassing me, calling me. You have to go in, you have to get checked again, you have to get another mammogram, et cetera, et cetera. I'm on the phone with like the hospital trying to figure out how to do this. And they're like, well, you have to go back to your primary care doctor to get referred. Call my primary care doctor. And he goes, no, 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 you have to get referred by your OBGYN, but you have to go to me first, cha-ching, and then to the OBGYN, cha-ching, to refer over to get the mammogram and the radiology department, cha-ching. Instead of just having you go in, yeah. I don't have anything right now, but I have to do this. It's, it's the system, it's like they don't communicate with each other. There's, the, the referral situation alone is, is it's insane. Insane. maddening. All right, three more of these. Uh, the end is uh, louder with Crowder. Elizabeth Warren just accused the Fed of being corrupt. Woo, we would you love to see you guys look into Evergrande in China with investors pulling knives, threatening suicide over last money. Happy Tuesday, MR crew. Don't book this burn. No phones today, no phones today, no phones today. Shit, did I not mean to send that four times? I'm sorry. And the final I am of the day. Let's see here. I'm going to scroll down. Uh, final I am of the day. Da -da 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 -da. Charge. Dave4133, the fact that Zuck can lose $7 billion to hide whistleblower evidence and not even bat an eye sums up exactly why we need to tax the rich. This, along with the Pandora Papers, doesn't lead you to accepting that we need wealth redistribution. I don't think there's help for you. Matt, Bradley, Emma, Nomi, great job today, guys. Folks, see you tomorrow. Yes. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught